This is Sarah Wolf calling to order the remote meeting of the Manchester Essex Regional School Committee on February 15th at 6 o'clock p.m. Welcome to everyone who's joining us tonight and thank you to 1623 Studios for posting the recordings for us. We will begin with public comment. I just want to take a moment to remind everyone that this is a, an opportunity for comment, not debate. As our policy states, a school committee meeting is a meeting of a government body at which members of the body deliberate over public business. We welcome the attendance of members of the, of the school district community to view your school committee as it conducts its regular business meeting, but these meetings are not designed to be an opportunity for dialogue. Please know that while we will not be immediately engaging with your comments or answering questions, we are listening and paying attention to your concerns. During the meeting, we will be focusing on items that are listed on our posted agenda. Um, and just so you all know, I know people are here to talk about a variety of issues. Um, if there is time later, I will consider reopening public comment after the budget discussion, but that is going to be time dependent. So I'm just letting you know that. Okay. If you would like to make a comment, and I know Mrs. Magania already started off, off in the chat with a comment request. So if you would like to make a comment, please put your name and your town in the chat. Please do not make other comments in the chat. We try to allot 20 minutes total for public comment. It can go over a little bit, but we do ask each person to limit their comments to three minutes or less if possible, especially when we know that there are gonna be a lot of people commenting. Um, I'll be timing the comments tonight and I'll ring my bell when you're getting close to three minutes so that you know your time is almost up. Um, it'll sound like this. After public comment is over, the chat function will be turned off to allow us all to devote our full attention to the meeting. And then after the public comment, we're gonna start with our student report. So, okay, I see that there are a lot of people in the chat already. Hold on, I have to just shrink this. And um, Mrs. Magania, would you like to lead us off? Yes, can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, the World Language Department would like to express our concern, frustration, and sadness at the proposal to remove the World Language Experience for all elementary school children in our district. In a world where we need to connect and identify more with people that are different from us, students need to learn at a young and impressionable age to empathize with those who speak, live, and think differently from themselves. To propose such a cut would deprive our communities of these fundamental experiences. Over the past 25 years, the World Language Department has had success in developing a program that is vertically aligned from the first grade through to the 12th grade. Our program is essential for language acquisition and proficiency development. In addition, students learn diversity and equity. As the Massachusetts World Language Framework states, world ready students fully participate in their local, national, and global communities by proficiently using multiple languages and demonstrating competency in multiple cultures. Having acquired linguistic and cultural proficiency, they are aware of and responsive to the world around them. They are empathetic listeners, viewers, understanding how challenging it can be to communicate in new languages. They demonstrate insight into the nature of culture, language, and communication, having compared their own experiences to the culture of the target language. These are all goals that are consistent with our curriculum and the vision of the graduate. At the elementary level specifically, many studies have reported that learning a world language at a young age will promote academic achievement, cognitive development, and a positive attitude about other cultures and beliefs. Learning a second language also teaches our students to be better communicators and to work cooperatively and collaboratively with others. These are all essential skills for life. Our elementary program sets us apart from other districts in our state and it prepares our students for the upper level courses provided in our district. At the middle school level, our seventh and eighth graders are able to complete a full year of Spanish or French and they begin high school in a level two course. Most students in the state begin high school in a level one introductory course. In the ninth grade, we currently run two honors and two college prep Spanish level courses. We also have one section of honors French and one CP level course. In the upper levels, we are able to offer three AP courses, AP language and culture in Spanish and French and AP literature, which is unheard of in many districts. Um, we would not be able to offer these courses to our students without the elementary program, giving our students a solid foundation for learning. If you are looking for indicators of success and data, you can look at our AP scores and the number of seals of biliteracy we have been able to award. In 2019, 95% of our AP Spanish language and culture students scored a three or better on the exam. In French, 93% scored three or better on the exam. And most impressively, 100% of our AP literature students scored a three or better on the exam. In 2020, our world language department was recognized as a high performing district by DESE due to the fact that 17 students were awarded the seal of biliteracy, 15% of our graduating class. 
Our students are graduating with proficiency and they're moving on with the knowledge and ability to communicate with ease in college, their professions and life experiences. These successes can only be achieved by, by maintaining the elementary program. As stated in the Massachusetts World Language Frameworks, a well-rounded pre-K through grade 12 world language education prepares students to contribute to an increasingly interconnected and complex world. Please make the right decision and do not cut the elementary through sixth grade program. Thank you on behalf of the World Language Department. Thank you, Mrs. Magania. All right, Shoshi, you're up next. Hi, Sarah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Fine. Okay, sorry, I meant to write in Manchester and didn't do that. So I'm speaking for uh, the Friends of Manchester Essex Performing Arts, uh, dear Ms. Bowden and school committee members. We understand that this is a very difficult school budget season. There are many cuts on the table and we know that it's difficult to determine which ones will have the least impact on, uh, impact on the programs and most importantly on the students. Though moving instrument lessons to a fee for service program like sports might seem like a simple cost saving move. Let me assure you it is not. Your proposal to move instrument lessons to a fee for service to cover the cost of the 0.7 FTE poses a number of challenges. Oh. As it currently stands, we have low enrollment in band. We have a particularly hard time keeping the fourth graders returning for band in fifth grade, and then we lose even more in middle school when they have to choose between band and chorus. If we move the instrument lesson program to a fee for service, there's great likelihood that fewer students will participate in band, leaving an already small program even smaller. If fewer students take instrument lessons when a fee is required, what will happen when the fees coming in no longer cover the 0.7 FTE? What will happen oh to the 0.7 FTE? We, are already, we already have very few performing arts teachers. After doing a data comparison with other small North Shore districts, Rockport and Ipswich, when adjusting for enrollment, MERSD oh has roughly half the performing arts teachers as Rockport and Ipswich. As Ms. Bowden often says, personnel or people impact programs. If we have roughly half the performing arts teachers as Ipswich and Rockport, what does that say about our programs? As it stands now, our performing arts offerings are light. Our DESI analysis for arts offerings shows a significant drop off in participation at the high school level. This is a significantly larger drop off when compared with our sister districts, so districts that are comparable in size, demographics, and performance. We often talk about MERSD as a high performing district, which should mean high performing in all areas, supporting the development of the whole child, including their participation and learning in the arts. Every performing arts educator and professional in our district and in others we have spoken to say that the way to grow performing arts programs starts at the elementary level. If we can't boost enrollment and even worse, lose students in band and instrumental lessons at the elementary level, it's difficult to ever have strong instrumental programs up through the grades. Moving instrument lessons to fee for service will negatively impact the program district wide. We ask that you not um, move um, instrument lessons to a fee-for-service program as one of your cuts. Thank you for your consideration from the Friends of Manchester Essex Performing Arts. Thank you. Are you muted? I'm sorry, I had to mute because my husband walked in the squeaky door. Betsy McKean, you're up. Hey all, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi guys, so I'm Betsy McKean. I'm a parent of a second and fourth grader at Essex Elementary. I'm also a board certified primary care pediatrician practicing in an adjacent town. I want to just thank the school committee for what I know you'll do, which is to carefully consider this complex issue of when to discontinue in school masking for staff and children. So when the governor made his announcement that the state mandated mask policy would be ending on February 28th, I, like most parents, felt a rush of excitement about the prospect of our kids finally being able to see their teachers and friends smiling faces in the classroom again. That return to normalcy is tantalizing. However, as a physician that's seen the rise and fall and rise again of COVID over the last two years, I would just urge a small amount of caution when making the masking decision. While many people, unfortunately, would turn this into a black and white and contentious issue, in reality, this decision's not binary because the future is unknown. We as a district need a solution to masking that addresses the ebb and flow of this virus, one that will protect individuals and populations when transmission's high and ensure a much needed break when transmission's low. 
And as many of us are aware, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC are both continuing to recommend, it, recommend indoor masking specifically in school settings for all individuals two and older, regardless of vaccination status. This is especially important in areas where community prevalence of COVID is still concerning. Here on the North Shore, I am so happy to see that COVID numbers are falling from rates that we were seeing in December and January, but it doesn't mean that COVID's gone yet. In Essex, our current positivity rate, and this is the most up-to-date data from February 10th, we're at 8.3% still. Um, and in Manchester, I believe the rate was to 5.6%. And of course, knowing that students and staff come from elsewhere besides our two towns, the Essex County as a whole current positivity rate is even higher at 9.3%. For those of us that consistently watch these numbers, the positivity rates are still pretty high. Additionally, with February break approaching, more families are gonna be traveling and gathering, and thus will have increased risk of contracting COVID and bringing it back to the district. I do have confidence that our district's medical team and school committee members will review all the most up-to-date prevalence numbers and take all the data into account when making this complicated decision. I have so much hope that if the district just takes a dynamic and data-driven careful approach to when to end masking, we will be back to some level of normalcy soon. And thank you. I guess just one last, I just wanna take one line to acknowledge that masking decision is not the only topic on the table tonight. And I do wanna reiterate my previous public comment that I as an Essex resident fully support the school budget as is without the additionally proposed budget cuts. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Betsy. Um, Katie Vandy. Hi there, can everyone hear me okay? I can hear you. Great, thank you. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'd like to speak tonight to voice my support for ending the mask mandates for our school district, which would be in alignment with Governor Baker and Commissioner Riley's recommendation. I do have two um, elementary school children in Essex, Mass, and I'm also a registered nurse. This district and the students it serves have been through enough. We are beginning to see the ill effects of these policies from all angles, physically, socially, emotionally, and academically. In the two years this pandemic has gone on, families have had the opportunity to gain clarity about their comfort levels and how they want to manage it. There are a lot more tools available to those that wish to use them, like one-way masking, but it's time for personal health choices and decisions to be placed back in the control of families and their physicians. I would further like to echo Commissioner Riley's words about supporting students and families in their decision-making around this issue. He stated, I ask all school leaders to respect individual choices around mask wearing. Please create a supportive environment that respects everyone's choice to do what is most appropriate and comfortable for them. This statement falls in line with the ethics of MERSD, its strategic plan and discrimination policies. Keeping the statement in mind, I would ask this board to please lift the man mask mandate with no conditions attached to vaccination status. This would further divide this community and in turn create more trauma and stress for families. The time has come for all of us to get our lives back, especially our children. I'm tired of hearing about how resilient children are, how adaptable, and how much they can handle. They have handled enough. The last normal school year my son Thomas had, who was now in fourth grade, was in first grade. My daughter Mia, who is now in first grade, has no framework yet for a normal school experience because she hasn't had one. Let's take this opportunity to move on from this and start a new path forward. Let's show our children that even after the most troubling of times, we still have the ability to smile, laugh, and be joyful. Let's give them the opportunity to let this joy and laughter shine through their faces again, not just with us, but with each other. Thank you for giving me the time to speak and read this letter, and I hope that you consider my statements when making your decision. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Katie. Um, Mr. Janak. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Joe Janak and I teach music classes in addition to being the band director for the middle and high school. This is my seventh year in the district and I'm very proud of the music program I've been a part of and the culture we as a music faculty have built. 
I'm here to talk about the proposed cut of the elementary instrumental music program and replacing it with an after-school fee-based service. As you might guess, I am strongly opposed to this proposed plan. I am particularly concerned about the negative and detrimental impact this would have on the instrumental program and the music program as a whole, as well as what it says about the district's values and support of the performing arts. This is beyond what this would possibly mean for my or one of my colleagues' jobs. At a time when a lot of other districts have seen a steep decline in participation and performances, we have been able to keep the momentum going in the music program here at MERSD. However, because of the pandemic, normal recruiting and retention efforts have not been able to occur. We need the opportunity to recover from this. We've also been forced to be creative and think outside the box. From putting together virtual performances, playing and singing outside in masks and 10 feet apart, to going through a semi-normal concert season the past few months, We've been able to persevere and show a tremendous amount of resilience while also performing well amid the ever-changing protocols in the world of the pandemic. The current elementary program we have, which provides instrumental lessons and band rehearsals for students in grades four and five is extremely valuable. Personally speaking, as someone who is taught in a district with a model similar to what you're proposing, there are a lot of unforeseen consequences that it raises. First off, there's an equity and access issue, as not all students will be able to afford the program, nor can they guarantee being able to participate outside of the school day. Having the current free program within the curricular day makes the access equitable for all. If students get to the sixth grade and there are some who have been able to participate and are extremely ahead of their classmates who are just starting their instrumental music education, it's on par with trying to teach multiple levels or different subjects even in the same room at the same time. Also, with it being outside of the school day, there is a sense that it is not considered a serious academic endeavor, while right now it is part of the school day and is given the same care and attention as other classes. Both students and teachers treat it that way. Lastly, the truth of the matter is that this will severely cut back on the number of students participating in the elementary program, which will eventually lead to lower numbers at the middle and high school. In talking with other band directors in the area, one said when when they switched to this model, the first year saw a 60% drop in participation in beginning band. That number is hard to make up and takes years to build back. Being in band allows students to perform, express themselves, have a place of acceptance, and teaches them how to work toward a common goal at the same time as building an individual skill. Studying music and playing instruments aids in brain development and function, as well as contributing positively to the student's social emotional well being. The work done at the elementary level is crucial to setting a strong foundation, and this cut would stunt that growth for our student musicians. The impact this would subsequently have on the community would also be substantial. It would impact the many public performances provided by the instrumental groups from school concerts to football games to school assemblies and graduation to community events such as the Memorial Day parades. Moving to a cost-based after-school elementary program will be detrimental to our students, our academic program, and our community. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Janak. Um, Guy Bradford from Essex is up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I'm going to simply, uh, for the Board of Selectmen, I'm going to read the, uh, the copy of the draft minutes for our most recent uh, Board of Selectmen meeting, which was a week ago, Monday the 7th. Uh, and I'm only going to be reading the part that relates to the, uh, the school budget collaboration uh, meeting summary. Um, so here it goes. Mr. Zabricki and Selectman Bradford reviewed various topics that were discussed at recent budget collaboration and school committee meetings. One of the main discussion points was whether or not cuts could be made, and if so, where. Selectman Bradford reviewed an analysis he had prepared regarding the evolution of the proposed budget to date. A lengthy discussion followed. School committee members Sarah Wolf, Wolf and Kay Koch Sunquist were present and contributed to the discussion. The selectmen agreed it is important for the district to present a final budget proposal that features an increase uh, between fiscal years 22 and 23, which is lower than the increase the town experienced between fiscal year 21 and 22. And that increase was 3.96%. And, and I just want to emphasize that this, these increases are the increases for the town of Essex after the overall increase has been apportioned between the two towns. Uh, while the parties also discussed the potential need for a Proposition 2.5 override in fiscal year 24, 
in order to sustain the district's goal of level services, the board did not want to commit to support for an override this far in advance. That said, the board agreed the chance of a successful override in fiscal year 24 will be improved if at the upcoming town meeting, it is clear the district and board were able to work collaboratively to make good on a request from town officials at the 2021 annual town meeting to reduce this year's budget increase request below that of fiscal year 21-22. There will be another budget meeting on February 15th and the board of selectmen will be posted for it tonight. Um, tonight. So uh, thanks. And Sarah then is going to have some sort of uh, comments that sort of follow on to, to what I've said. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Guy. Um, Tamar. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, all right. So I just have a quick comment statement about the mask, mask mandates and COVID precautions. Uh, I live in Manchester and have daughters that are currently in first and third grades at Manchester Memorial School. I look forward to discussion this evening on lifting the MERSD student mask mandate. There are metrics around severe illness and hospitalization rates in children that currently support such a change. While overall hospital numbers in children were higher than prior COVID-19 waves, the amount of severe illness seen in children was less, which is consistent with what we are seeing overall with this less severe Omicron variant. Vaccination and voluntary masking, one-way masking are certainly encouraged. As a physician at our local community hospital, I recommend that MERSD follows the guidance put forth by DESI calling for no mandatory masks in school starting on Monday, February 28th, 2022. And I have two last comments that um, kind of came up from the prior, earlier comments that um, the, due to the behavior of the Omicron variant, we're approaching an endemic status. And so I think the goals of eradication of this virus is just, it's, it's not a realistic goal. So I think we are gonna have to learn to live with COVID-19 and it's never gonna go away. So we have to figure out how do we move forward? How do we as adults and how do we with our children and with um, our children's education, like the flu, we're, we are unlikely to eradicate this illness. So we just have to figure out how to live with it. So thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Um, Donna first would like to make a comment. Is Donna on the phone or on the computer? I'm on the computer, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Well, thank you for letting me speak. I'll be very, very brief. Um, first, I'd like to say, um, with regards to the budget, I think any further cuts to the school budget would be very detrimental to our students and our families and our teachers. But my comment is actually about the high school turf field. Um, the high school field is going into its 13th year and has been in dire need of replacement for many years. It is my understanding that the turf field is supposed to undergo replacement this summer from funds that have been previously allocated from the last budget. I know it's hard balancing, discussing teacher cuts and curriculum changes against a new field. But if the field is yet again put aside, the potential increased injury stability that our field does not get insured um, all becomes a reality or a potential reality. Um, and if that happens, outsourcing our field sports becomes a reality. So I was just concerned in making a comment of whether or not with all the discussion of budget, is whether or not the field will actually go forward with being replaced this summer. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you, Donna. Um, all right, Ben. Yes, good evening. Um, hi, Sarah. Uh, hi, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so yes, I just wanted to follow up on, on uh, Selectman Bradford's uh, comments about the town of Essex, the ask uh, on the budget apportionment. And I just wanted to provide a little bit of added context. I should also introduce myself, Ben Buttrick, chair of the Essex Finance Committee, um, that you know, we're in the middle of the town's budget process right now. And the, the total operating budget for the town of Essex is tracking at over 21.3 million, uh, which right now stands at 3.92% over last year even with some good news around health insurance. And I, sh I should say that includes the district budget 
as of the last draft at the 4.97%, which I just want to clarify. Um, so we're still well over the levy limit of 2.5%. And even if the district finds a way to get the apportionment down to 3.5% uh, for Essex, uh, the town would still be looking at $160,000 shortfall to close. So it, Essex has some significant budget challenges this year. And there's an economic basis behind the town's request, which I just want to make sure is not lost in the discussion. Our ability to manage the town's budget gap is heavily dependent on where the district lands in the budget discussion, which is before the school committee. Um, one area that I would say that is well understood this year versus last is the reality that the impact of enrollment trends uh, 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 on the Essex apportionment is significant and will be with us for the next few years. There's no remedy to that. It is what it is. If 3.5% is the level services growth number, then 5 plus percent for Essex is likely, and the town will have to expect and plan for that. An override vote needs to happen next year because the revenue adjustment will need to not only make up for any structural deficit, but also finance the agreed upon growth trajectory for the district. That should be the will of the residents in determining what that trajectory going forward is. So the Essex request that Guy Bradford just articulated in the spirit of collaboration would be immensely helpful to Essex in the short term with the hope that any accommodation be viewed favorably in the override consideration for next year. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, Olivia. McLeod. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, as a um, to start with, uh, as a foreign language teacher, I'd like to voice my support for everything Michelle Magania said earlier regarding not cutting the elementary school foreign language program. Um, I, I'd also like to voice my opposition to lifting the mask mandate at the end of the month. I sincerely sympathize with the students and parents who have had to put up with the mandate for so long. As a teacher, I promise that I don't like it any more than they do. No one likes to wear masks and everyone would love for school to get back to normal. But I truly feel that it is too soon to lift the mandate. And I believe that allowing students and staff back to school unmasked immediately after the February break, when many will have been traveling is asking for trouble. I would strongly urge waiting until COVID numbers further decrease. Um, on a personal note, I am currently six months pregnant and according to the CDC, at a higher risk for severe illness from COVID, as well as a greater risk for preterm birth and even stillbirth. Um, although the situations of everyone must be concerned, I would be very afraid for my own safety and that of my unborn child if the mass mandate were to be lifted. Uh, thank you for this time. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Rubin. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Sarah, before I start. We go on, sorry, Sarah, before we hear, can, can we just remind people that the chat portion is not to be used for anything other than your name and address? Here. Oh, yes, Especially that is very like true. That. Please, the chat is only for name and address if you're planning to make a public comment. Thanks for pointing that out, Teresa. Thank you. If, uh, if I may just indulge with a poem, it's called The, uh, the Face of a Child it's by Tina Zellner. Through the face of a child, you can see so much. They have very soft smiles with a warm, gentle touch. You can see the sweetness in all that they do, the precious look when you tell them you love them too, the smile on their face when they play in the rain, the sad on their face when they're aching with pain. A child is so precious, God's gift from above. So give them your heart and give them your love. Sometimes they may not say and sometimes they may not show. It's then that they really need you more than you know. So give them your time and show them how to grow for all of them are special more than we know. And I say that this poem sort of uh, warms, I hope everyone's heart and notice the name is the face of a child. I think it's time after two long years, we're exhausted and it's time for children to see each other's faces at school. There was a petition started by a student at the high school this morning. Uh, last I checked, it guarded well over 200 signatures. I think I speak for the vast overwhelming majority of the people from both communities that we 
plead and dare I say even beg at the school committee tonight and the school mandate and let it be the school mask mandate and let it be a choice. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey and um, Nina. And again, please leave the chat alone unless you're putting your name in to make a comment. We could probably close the chat now since I think Nina is the last public comment. Yes, I totally agree. We should definitely close the chat right now. And Nina, you can go ahead. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thanks again. Um, Nina McKinnon, Essex, parent of a high school student, member of the Essex FinCom as well. And I wanted to just follow up on, you know, comment I'd made in the last school committee meeting. It seems that there was a lot of comments that were made on, I guess, that on my behalf at Facebook, myself and my husband actually were stopped at various locations, uh, local spots, restaurants and such in the last two weeks, um, certainly helped by the Gloucester Times article. The core of what I've been asking, I think in some ways what the FinCom over the last two years have been asking, I am speaking just for myself, is really why. And we're asking to see data to support the why. I know the turf field was previously brought up but using that as an example, in the fiscal year 21 public school budget meeting, it was presented that the turf fields need a replacement at $1 million for Highland and Brook Street field. Brook Street Manchester owns res Essex residents actually can receive a parking ticket there. I asked why we had to replace them then and we were told it was imperative for the safety of the students. What has changed for these turfs to now be safe and then the cost just gets pushed off another year. The following information that I'm listing is found on DESE. In 2003-04, MERSD had a total enrollment of 1,226 students with 121.5 faculty. For the 2020-21 school year, we had a total enrollment of 1,264 students with 129.6 faculty. We now have an enrollment of 1,250 students with 132.7. Why do 24 students need an additional 10 headcount? Our current student teacher ratio is 9.8 to 1, which is very is much smaller compared to our neighboring uh, town districts. My son would have been in this year's graduating class at MERSD. He left after 10th grade. Since sixth grade, the class of 23 has had its enrollment drop by seven and a half percent. This year's 10th grade class has had their enrollment drop by 20 and a half percent. And this year's ninth grade class has dropped by 11 percent. Is anyone asking these families why they left? I can say for myself, no one ever asked me why we pulled our son. Lastly, the recently proposed cuts are focused at the elementary school, which isn't surprising. This is where parents stay most involved as we are hearing tonight. Are there no areas to review in the middle school and the high school? For reference, I know Hamilton Wenham did cut their K through five foreign language program a few years ago. In lieu of that, they now offer a special ed fund to help with it. Difficult times present opportunity for evaluation for planning. What is working? What is not? For the older students, are there options to look at? In the previous meeting, the school committee mentioned they'd be sending a survey to parents about the middle school, high school cafeteria. Is school food our most pressing item? Why not make it a more comprehensive survey? Thanks, Ask Nina. That's your three minutes. You know, thank you. I appreciate it. Other people did speak for three minutes. I promise I will be really quick. Yeah, that was your three minutes. Okay. I rang the bell and then that was three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry, Sarah, I, we're not hearing the bell for whatever reason. So I think that's why she was confused. Oh, that's, I'm sorry. I did, I did ring the bell. I'm sorry. sorry I didn't hear it. Um, okay. Uh, yes. So, um, in the spirit of making sure that people feel that they can make their public comments without, um, a back and forth. Uh, I just would invite everybody to listen very closely to stay on when we have our budget workshop so that we can correct any misconceptions that might be out there um, regarding some of the comments. Um, and yes, are there any public comments on the phone that we should be asking for? 
there anyone on the phone? If you're on the phone and you wanted to make a comment, could you please unmute yourself and let it be known? Hi, this is Hello, Kristen my name McLaughlin. Is Antonio. Oh, okay. Uh, Kristen McLaughlin, I heard you first. Can you go ahead and make your comment, please? Thank you. Um, I'm a parent and I live in Manchester by the sea. I have twins in third grade um, in separate classrooms. I'd like to voice my support for rescinding the mask mandate in the school and hope that the school committee would follow Desi's recommendation for all schools in Massachusetts. Um, I'm an attorney. I've researched the issue for hours on end as masking is significantly important to me and my child who is on an IEP and who both of my children are having difficulty learning this year and last year without being able to read their teacher's lips and see their teacher's smiles or frowns. Many times my children come home and say that the teacher, not any particular teacher, I'm not saying it's their classroom teacher, but it could be any teacher, maybe raise their voice at them or repeat something multiple times but my children may not have heard it through the teacher's mask. My child interprets that as the teacher being upset with them and are very sensitive kids. And it's having a complete adverse effect on their learning and their social development in a classroom and in a school setting to the extent my child does not want to go to school. Um, there are study upon study upon study about masks being dirty, children inhaling their germs from sneezing in their mask and then continuing to wear it for seven plus hours a day while there are parents and other people out in the community walking into Crosby's, walking into the library without a mask, working in offices, working in grocery stores without masks all day. But our children, our babies, have to go for seven plus hours a day muzzled with these masks. And it's not fair to the kids that don't understand what their teachers are saying, that can't see their, their, their smiles, that don't know if they're getting yelled at or reprimanded because they can't hear what their teacher's saying. So the studies show the masks are dirty, the masks do not benefit anyone, even if you're pregnant, because it says on the box, unless you're wearing an N95, you are susceptible to spreading even coronavirus. It says it on the disposable mask box. So I'm sure Desi looked into all of the pros and cons of masks and mask wearing for school, and they came up with and okay, end result. Kristen, Kristen, thank you. Your time's up. That was three minutes, but thank you so much. I think we get your point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Antonio Bussone. Oh, yes, go ahead, Antonio. Thank you for waiting. Uh, I would like just to make a public comment about the use of the mask, and I would like to say that we need to stop ignoring the fact. Uh, masks, in fact, do not work. Uh, the proof is the fact that while everybody was wearing a mask, we have the highest vertical rise of infections. So if the mask did work or helped to mitigate, we would not experience that. Um, and science is empiric, so we can see what happened. Um, I understand that wearing masks and forcing use of masks, our public school got three rounds of grants from the government. And I know there were budget issues, but at this point, we cannot keep ignoring the fact. We cannot. Uh, going the wrong direction. I also would like to raise a couple of questions, such as if an individual has COVID and he's from COVID, so as natural immunity, can he spread the virus? The answer is clearly is no. If an individual does not have COVID, can he spread COVID? The answer is no. So to force a child to wear a mask when he cannot spread the virus, it's preposterous and never come to an end. I know that people refer to CDC and recommendations. I can show a clip of two minutes of Dr. Fauci, the number one virologist in the country, is defined, in which 26 times he said everything in the opposite of everything about wearing masks, no need to wear a mask, you can wear a mask, you don't need to wear a mask. If you have, if you're indoor, outdoor, children, 
vaccinated or unvaccinated, he contradicts himself 26 times. I don't know what more we need to drop this charade and let our kids smile and go back to regular life. Masks do not help. Pregnant or non-pregnant, they do not help. So please, let's make the right decision. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Antonio. Is there somebody else on the phone who would like to make a public comment? If you're on the phone and you'd like to make a comment, this is your last chance. Okay, um, then I think we can move on. I believe that um, Diego is here and I think maybe Charlie is here with you, Diego, and you guys are going to give a student report and then talk about the ADL program. Um, yeah, can can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Okay. I can hear you just fine. Um, yeah, so me and Charlie, we're going to talk about ADL and then I also have my student report as well. Separate from that. Um, if that's okay, I'm assuming. Whatever you want to do in your order is great. All right, great. Um, so before Charlie, um, kind of comes on and explains really what we're doing. I'll just introduce the ADL a little bit. Um. The ADL is the Anti-Defamation League. Um, most simply, their mission is to secure justice and fair treatment for all everywhere in the United States and in the world as well. Um, since I was in sixth grade in middle school, I've been going to um, ADL workshops. Um, we used to go in Boston before the pandemic, and then it kind of became more remote. Um, and basically, they kind of lead us through conversations, talking about bias, talking about... Um, prejudice within our own school and um and, and things like that um for the upperclassmen right now uh there were actually in past years like uh 10th through 12th graders that wouldn't present it to them um when they were in high school and actually this year we had a few days of um preparation where we went through all the activities that we are now um presenting to this year's freshmen um to kind of like help people have different difficult conversations about um bias prejudice um racism sexism and stuff of that nature in our school um charlie if you want to take over you can go into more detail thank you diego can everyone hear me yes okay hi everyone my name is charlie weld i use she her pronouns and i am a senior here at the high school as diego said um, we have had the opportunity to engage in the anti-defamation league for uh for myself it's been four years i was in ninth grade when the program was first kicking off and i actually got to experience being taught by the peer trainers um so in my ninth grade i had people who are now what i do um come and teach the lessons to us so i was on both sides of it and i thank the school committee for giving us the platform to share the work that we've been uh, learning and doing together. So, as Diego said, we seek to fight or find ways to combat prejudice and bias that is deeply seated in our community. So, the first things that we do is we actually get to train with people from the ADL for two days. Um, they lead us through activities that we will teach the ninth graders, and they teach us how to facilitate these conversations that can sometimes get to be a little bit difficult. And um, so after those two days where we got to learn from these fantastic trainers, we have a day of session prep where we make a session for each uh, day that we're planning on going in. And we hope to create a nice flow where we can kind of build intensity from subjects that are a little bit easier to talk about to things that are a little bit harder to consume. Um, and so we go through activities that we think are beneficial. And as a group, we create a lesson plan to bring to these classrooms. So we then engage in additional um, additional meetings. These are with our two advisors, Lauren DuBois and Jessica Tran. Uh, we do these additional meetings where we sit down with our group of about four to five students that will be going into each ninth grade class. And so we set and talk these four goals across the four sessions. So on the first day, we focus on building a safe environment about ways we can make the school a better place. Uh, and start these meaningful conversations respectfully, so they often end up getting be, be in getting to know each other. Icebreaker activities; these can be anywhere ranging from name and pronoun sharing to what we call guidelines for courageous co conversations, where we create an acrostic poem with respect and how we want to feel in a room where we're sharing difficult sentiments like these. 
On the second day, we really dive into the concept of identity, which is um, one of the most fun activities and days. I think we do a lot of interesting uh, kind of different ways of exploring these topics and some of these things are easier to share and why some things about identity are harder so we one of my favorite activities is uh where we use pipe cleaners and we create three pieces of our identity and then at the end we ask people to remove a piece and sit on it and how that feels uncomfortable and why that feels uncomfortable for people who have to hide a piece of their identity the third day we truly talk about bias and prejudice and the ways they manifest our, themselves in our daily life and not only just in um, our kind of small society of our school and our, our towns, but on the greater scale of America and the world itself. On the fourth day, we practice practical ways for ninth graders to confront situations. Uh, the keyword here being practical, these are things that we hope people can truly go out and use every day and how we actually make our environment a better place and stand up for what we see wrong or if we see people are being mistreated. So this is kind of a day where leaving there, we want them to have an answer to the big question of what can you do and have tools to back up that answer. And overall, we want to continue to build our group. Uh, we recruit ninth graders all the time. As a senior, I'll be leaving next year and leaving it in the hands of, of underclassmen. So I'm really excited for the future. I think it, the program is growing absolutely beautifully. Um, and we so far have had one visit into ninth grade classes and we have had another training session for our second day which is identity and then we are heading back into those classrooms to keep getting down to the work and it is truly fantastic results it's an amazing program and i am very grateful to be a part of it so thank you very much for hearing a little bit about it tonight charlie can i ask you one question i don't want to put you on the spot but i just have one question yes what would you say to people who say, we don't need this kind of program in our schools? I sometimes hear that from parents. Absolutely. So I think that it is sometimes hard for people to wrap their head around this type of program being integrated in schools because it hasn't been. Anything that's new is going to be hard. But the thing is, is that these things aren't new. These things have been plaguing our country and our society for so long. And it is time that we arm people with the tools to battle it. And if we are trying to create the quote vision of the graduate, people who can enter society in a way that's constructive and they can be better on behalf of their high school education, then these are things that they do need. And these are absolutely important skills to become a whole person and just as important as going out and being able to do calculus in your day to day life, I would argue way more important. So this is absolutely essential in schools and it's not only something that will give them an individual sense of accomplishment and, and knowing, but it will also, it's a way truly to build such a stronger community. And I've already seen bonds flourish within the group that I'm a part of within the ADL ourselves. I know Diego and I didn't really know each other too well before starting ADL, but now we have a great um, bond together. We're speaking at the school committee meeting together. so. And not only being a ninth grader who experienced this, I have seen so much growth within myself. I have learned so much about uh, so much that we're the content that we talk about. And so I think that, yes, it's new. Yes, um, it might take a minute to truly understand the mission statement and the lesson plans. But once you get it, I promise it is so essential. And um, I really hope that people can take a minute to digest everything and sit back and look at truly the objective, beautiful results that are going to come of this type of education. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. I'm um, just, did anyone else, I know we're, it's already getting late, but did anybody else on school committee have anything they wanted to say to Charlie regarding the ADL? I just want to thank you, Charlie, so much for your hard work, not just tonight talking so poised and elegantly with 190 people on the line, but, you know, for the hard work that you've put in over the last four years, it's so impressive and we are so grateful to have students like you in our school system. Thank you. We're very lucky to be supported and I hope we can continue to, uh, to be supported through this incredible program. Thank you. Anyone else from school committee? Okay, thank you so much, Charlie. Um, and then Diego, a uh, regular student report. Yes. Um, so tonight I would like to talk, obviously the relevant 
kind of like white elephant in the room of masks um and kind of the student opinion on um on potentially updating the mask mandate and, and making masking optional from what i can tell um the majority of the students believe that the mask mandate should be lifted and that masking should become optional i, I can tell personally that there has been mask fatigue not only among students but also among teachers and feeling the need to constantly enforce the mask mandate in school i can personally tell that at least 25 to 30 percent of the student body is either not wearing their mask properly or not wearing their mask at all along with that there's also not consistent enforcement of the mask mandate so me myself and a lot of other students i would say the majority of people are questioning the effectiveness of the mask mandate right now considering that barely any people even follow it Students are also confused about how we can go to a business in Manchester. We can go work a job in Manchester. You could even go to the Super Bowl if you wanted to and not have to wear a mask. But when you come to school, you have to wear a mask, especially like considering Governor Baker's state, uh, like ending the statewide mask mandate for children. Students are also confused why that wouldn't apply to our school, considering that we're a state in Massachusetts. I also think that on a more personal level, I have three vaccines. I get tested once a week from the school, sometimes even twice, and I followed all of the rules over the pandemic to a T. Right now, I don't see how it makes any sense for me or other students in a similar situation to have to wear a mask after we've tested negative for COVID and have two base shots plus a booster shot. Beyond these points, I also think that the district has um, the tools to go back to a mask mandate, you know, if we need to, if COVID rates are going up. We contact trace, we test, we have all of these tools at our disposal to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So if there is a spike, yeah, sure, we can go back to the mask mandate. But right now, I, I think that a lot of students don't really think um, that it's necessary. I also think that students were frustrated that they weren't, that the students themselves weren't really given any numbers of in or proof of in-school transmission as to why we were even wearing the masks in the first place once everyone started getting vaccinated. Um, I understand that some people are concerned about spikes and whatnot, and I understand that people have even said we've had COVID cases with the masks on, but I don't really see any evidence pointing to the fact that those cases are because of in-school transmission. I guess like just to kind of summarize my point and how the students are feeling is that people are very upset, and I think that people are a little angry maybe that we've had to wear masks for so long. I understand at the beginning of the pandemic, it may have been necessary, but we feel that we're now in a place where we don't have to. We're also disappointed, like just how angry like people are, like even on like the town Facebook group and stuff like that. I think that that anger and that animosity is a sign that the mask mandate is time to go. Um, obviously I, I can't speak for everybody, but I would say that's at least how the vast majority of, um, of the students are feeling. Um, on an unrelated kind of note, I would also like to say that just talking to people around the school and um, like my friends and, and even just hearing conversations, people were very surprised to hear that they're considering cutting the elementary school, a world language program. And me personally, and a lot of people that I've talked to have said that the world language program at an elementary level actually really helped them prepare for middle school and eventually high school Spanish and French classes as well. Um, so that's also just something I thought I would mention. Thank you. Thanks, Diego. Does, does anyone on school committee have questions or thoughts for Diego tonight? I just, I was going to say, I'd like to just thank Diego for, you know, I was gonna say making it a point to be on here regularly and sharing, um, your perspective and bringing us kind of closer to what the students of the schools are. So thank you for taking the time and also to Charlie. It's great to have both of you. Yeah, always good to hear the student voices. Yeah, thank thank you all for um, giving me the opportunity to speak. I always appreciate it. And I think also the students appreciate it that someone is able to represent them on the school committee as well. Thank you. Thanks, Diego. Um, okay, so moving along on the agenda, I believe that um, my report is the next thing up. Let's see. Uh, my report tonight is very similar to my report last week because we are in the middle. We are going to get to the masks, don't worry. But 
That's not what my report is about because I knew we were going to be talking about it a lot. We are in the middle of a very difficult budget situation that will undoubtedly affect your children. If you were unhappy with the district's response to COVID last year, you may remember that a lack of resources was one of the driving factors keeping us in remote. The district is currently doing the best that it can to provide the educational and social emotional resources that our students need in the wake of the pandemic. I believe with all my heart that our towns benefit from having strong public schools. So, as you may have heard, we have a massive budget challenge right now. Um, we heard from Guy and Ben and they sort of explained what's happening um, in the town of Essex side. Um, and tonight we'll be discussing options and impacts of budget decisions. We are glad that you're here listening. Um, as you will hear tonight, we're still being asked to make a really significant budget reduction. Um, so it's a lot to take in. These are extraordinarily hard decisions. And we ask you to recognize that when our member towns ask us to reduce the budget, it puts us in a very difficult position. Uh, we have to discuss options tonight that will have a direct impact on our educational program. If you have concerns about what you're hearing tonight, I really encourage you to reach out to your town officials um, to let them know that you support the public schools and that you will be willing to support and override um, next year, as well as wanting to support the schools now, because we really have to plan for not only this coming year, but also um, we need to plan for the future. Um, so I invite you to stay for the entire meeting. I know um, a lot of you might have been here mostly to hear about the mask conversation, um, but we will be talking about the budget more later. So uh, I really hope that people will stay on. Um, and for now, though, we're just going to move on to the consent agenda, which includes minutes from January 11th and a bunch of vouchers, numbers um, 1036, which was the Green Communities Grant that you may have read about in the Gloucester Daily Times um, <clears throat> for a new HVAC system for Essex. Uh, 1037, which was mostly professional development facilities, utilities, and the outstanding balance from the Essex playground and site mitigation work that we did there. Um, 1038 for Medicare payments, 1039 from the activity fund and 1040 and 1041 uh, to wrap up the Manchester Memorial, maybe not wrap up, but for the Manchester Memorial school building. So um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So move Sarah, if I can work. Thanks Ken, do I have a second? Second, Burke. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Okay, I'll go in roll call to approve the consent agenda. Eric? Yes. Matt? Yes. Kate? Yes. Chris? Yes. Teresa? Yes. Ken? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Okay, thanks everybody for the consent agenda. Uh, passes unanimously. We have subcommittee reports reports on our agenda tonight. We're going to start with facilities. Um, Teresa and Chris, do you have something to share from the facilities committee? Sure. Um, I wasn't able to attend. I know we had a walkthrough at Essex uh, last week. I wasn't able to attend because of some work commitments, and I know that Teresa uh, was also unavailable. I was able to attend the uh, school building committee meeting. Uh, that was that evening. Uh, the meeting was very short. It was about five minutes, uh, specifically talking about wrapping up uh, some issues with Memorial School, um, and then also some brief discussion about the need to replace Essex Elementary School. Um, you know, there really wasn't, any, there, there was really no changes from uh, previous updates. Uh, you know, there was a walkthrough. I, I think the need, we all understand the need for that to be a priority for the district to replace replace the Essex Elementary School. Um, and it seems like, you know, that process is, you know, moving along at its expected pace. Uh, I, I was on the, the walkthrough for the Essex Elementary School um, and also was, um, Ken was. Does Ken, do you want to say anything or Pam or Avi want to weigh in on the walkthrough no, of Essex stuff, Elementary? Put away your paddle. Paddle? Yeah, I'll just say, I think if everyone can just mute while they're on, um, it was instructive and as always reminds me of the need for, we've moved through Manchester Memorial starting when I first joined the committee about six years ago um, to Essex Elementary. And I'm amazed at what the district has able, been able to do to keep the school going, but um, the 
the building, the, I'm glad the HVAC improvements were made. We're able to keep things going, but I worry about the longevity of that building. And I'm glad we continue to move forward to the building committee to lay the groundwork to get ready to address that significant stuff that's required. That's all I've got, Sarah. Yeah, I, I would say um, anybody who's on the call, especially if you live in Essex, if you have the opportunity to get a walkthrough of the Essex Elementary School building, I think one thing we talked about was maybe having that available uh, before or after the town meeting, just when it's open to the public and people can take the time to go through and look at some of the more significant issues we're having. Um, I think that would be great. So I would definitely recommend that you take advantage of that opportunity if you have a chance. Um, can I just tag on two quick points? Because yeah. I know we're pressed for time. For time. The, yeah. the outcome from the walkthrough and the walkthrough was for uh, boards of selectmen, finance and school committee, as well as the seated building committee. We have asked um, the building committee members who have particular expertise in building and development to kind of mull over what they saw. And there's going to be a recommendation coming out of that group um, from kind of a structural um, and uh, engineering perspective, what might be an appropriate timeline for that building or what their recommendations would be. And additionally, we are going to have what we're dubbing the Habib 2 report, um, but a facilities assessment of Essex and the middle high school done this spring. So it can combine with the SBC's outlook, um, some data, so we can make a real solid projection on the year that that building likely will need to be put in for SOI. So we have a counterbalance to just what our financial needs might be. Okay. Um, thanks, Pam. All right, moving on. Um, I don't think we really need a finance committee report. The collaborative, the collaborative group met again this morning, but we're going to be talking about the budget quite a bit later. So I don't think we need to have a separate report on that right now. Um, Teresa, unless there's something you really wanted to say. No, Matt was going to say exactly what you just said. We met this oh, morning. Okay. We'll talk later. Um, and then uh, policy committee. I don't think we have a. Do we have a policy committee report? No. Okay. Um, then Ken had something to say about negotiations. Yeah, Sarah, um, I, just in terms of negotiations, I just wanted to kind of remind everyone, update everybody that over the past several months, we've been negotiating with the Manchester Essex Teachers Union, um, really around a one year extension to their current contract, which is we hope to extend after our three year contract expires later this year. Um, because the Omicron surge immediately after returning from break in January, we we delayed in-person negotiations and training where we really wanted to get into that. Um, in, into that, we did, um, Sarah and I have been meeting with MEDA and the MERSD administration to continue to work out that contract um, extension terms. So what we've been carrying, and you'll hear more about it in the budget to, tonight discussions, I suspect, we carried a 2.2.5% cost of living adjustment, which the acronym for that is COLA, that reflects the 2.5% that was in each of the three years of the previous um, contract. So what we're hoping and have discussed with Mita is to really begin discussions on another three-year contract over the next several months. Um, so I am not sure what the mechanism we are into this, but really where we're heading down to is between school committee and MEDA finalizing what that um, agreement is, that one year extension. Because what we really wanna do is with all that we've heard tonight, we'll hear further around budget. We do wanna provide some degree of certainty for both the district, our towns, our staff, and really keep this candid, effective working relationship that um, we've developed. We wanna keep that relationship going and make sure that we at least have some certainty as we go forward. So that's my report, Sarah. Um, I don't know. Correct. Feel free to correct I or adjust. That we, um, I believe that we are looking for a vote tonight to approve our our side of of that one year contract extension, so that we can begin negotiating a new three year contract. Um, so, do I have a motion to approve that one year contract extension? So moved, Kate. Is there a second? Second, Burke. Is there any further discussion? I'd just like to add, Sarah, and I know we have it. Uh, I just basically like to add it is essentially the language on it is very simple. Just to remind the other school committee members. I don't know. Um, and has it just basically says we're continuing the previous 3 year. Agreement for the next year, and we're going to begin negotiations. Yeah. For another 3 year. Okay. 
Um, so we're just going to do a roll call vote. Eric. Yes. Matt. Yes. Kate. Yes. Chris. Yes. Teresa. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I'm a yes. And next on our agenda is um, Pam is going to give her superintendent report, which is going to be an update on the masking conditions and the reports that we've had from our health groups. And uh, hopefully we can move forward with a decision. So Pam, you are on. Damien, listen up, this is the mask part. <laughs> um, if your name is Todd and you just called to your child, maybe just make sure you mute your phone. That would be great, thank you. Okay, so this is the this is the policy portion uh, of the evening, which is, you know, we've had so many people speak to it already, and I don't think there's anyone in the two towns that doesn't know um, what's going on or the decision before us tonight. But uh, last week, the commissioner announced that as of February 28th, he was going to be lifting uh, the mask mandate uh, for the public schools of Massachusetts. So I'm here tonight to talk to you about uh, what our responsibility is um, in aligning with that over the next uh, couple of weeks. So very, I'm going to do this uh, very briefly because we are deep into the meeting already. Um, and if we want to go more in depth in response to any questions the committee might have in, in making its determination tonight, we can certainly do that. So just very briefly um, last week, uh, the commissioner again uh, amended the current guidance that has had us uh, required to be using masks in schools up until this point, um, and as of February 28th, that will go away. Uh, the same week, um, Essex and Manchester uh, ended their uh, public building mask requirements that happened on February 10th in two separate meetings. Today, uh, the Mass Department of Health, which is the basis behind uh, the commissioner's determination for rescinding the mask mandate, uh, put out its advisory, um, again, supporting the idea of a voluntary mask usage, but strongly encouraging and um, steering people who have um, underlying conditions uh, toward continued use of masks. And then uh, we have the CDC, which has been another touch point for us. Uh, they have yet to update their guidance, but so they are still um, recommending universal masking for all students um, in the public school setting. Uh, but in discussions with our health team, which is comprised of our nurses, members of the boards of health, um, including um, epidemiologists and the local uh, town representatives to the board of health, uh, they were reporting that they anticipate um, this being updated within the next few weeks. So this has set the stage for having um, within Massachusetts and locally much support um, behind the idea of dropping the mask mandate and moving to a um, a more endemic mindset, which places personal res individuals um, responsible for their own actions and choices. Uh, so my recommendation, I always have a glitch with my technology. Uh, this is just the language of the DESE guidance if we wanted to jump into it. I will spare you no longer. My recommendation is to do as we've done throughout the year when DESE um, puts out new advisories, guidelines, or guidance, which is we should align with the guidance that DESE is offering. Um, they're, backing, they're backed by the Department of Health, as I mentioned earlier. Um, however, we recognize that there are some instances when we will need to use masks. I think Diego was on the money with his commentary. Um, and the day today, there's you know three specific instances: return to school after a five-day COVID absence. The requirement is that you would have to uh, wear a mask to return to school. Um, if you're symptomatic um, or have um, an undefined respiratory system, meaning you don't have an underlying allergy or condition to which it can be traced to, we would ask that you um, mask in the building and while in the health room. The only caveat to this um, is that. Currently, um, under federal guidelines, you have to continue to wear masks on the buses. So that's one place where we would still have to be uh, requiring kids to mask in addition to uh, these three conditions. Uh, everyone's moving quickly this week. The um, Mass Association of School, uh, School Committees has already put out an updated guidance document, which we could vote to um, adopt 
um, in place of the one that we currently have uh, that basically outlines all of these circumstances and makes voluntary with strong recommendation. It's in, I believe I sent it to all of you. If not, I'm happy to bring it up. Um, it makes voluntary with strong recommendation as to, you know, continued use under particular situations and then enumerates them within. So I think all um, in the conversations with the health team, I'll, I'll just add that a uh, great deal of confidence among medical professionals and public health policy professionals in that group um, to move forward with this feeling that um, the state recommendation comes with the power of the Mass Department of Health and that our local conditions are such that we don't have um, anything that we could point to locally to uh, negate that. So my position is that we should consider implementation and I think what's up for discussion is uh, do we implement on the 28th? Do we wait a week or two and implement later in March? So that is for the team to discuss tonight. Happy to answer questions or take you through any more um, information. I would offer that for those who are you know, concerned and we have heard from people on both sides for sure. Um, we do have the home testing program, which anyone can avail themselves of. Um, if you're planning on continuing masking and we strongly encourage anybody who wants to continue masking to continue masking, um, I think I think you know again. Diego mentioned it; it's part of who we've become. And in different situations, people are choosing to do things that um, are best for them. Um, if you haven't already enrolled in the at-home testing program, we have about uh, 450 uh, students and about 200 faculty enrolled in the program. It's limitless, so everyone is um, encouraged to join. You'll have access to free at-home kits once every other week. This is an added layer of protection for you if you want to be continue to be um, vigilant about COVID and your own personal situation. Uh, and what we're going to be doing in addition to our regular distribution is we're going to send out a batch at the end of this week. And this is all by the design of the nurses who have been doing a fabulous job through all of this. They're going to send home two tests with everybody so they can uh, test the Sunday evening before they return and then uh, choose to test again on our regular testing day Tuesday. In case they feel like they want to monitor themselves um, upon return from vacation. So, in a nutshell, state data is pointing us in this direction. Our local data, um, according to Board of Health, also supports it. So, I see no reason to not move forward in alignment with the Department of Ed. Does anyone have a question? Question? Anyone on the school committee have a question for Pam? Before we get a motion on the table that we are able to discuss. Pam, I have a question about um, uh, the guidance around the family choice and um, encouraging um, individuals who want to continue masking to continue masking. Um, I can see that being implemented really effectively at the high school level and maybe the middle school level. I'm not sure how that would look in an elementary school classroom. If you have a family who's making a family choice to mask, but say a five or six year old who's going to school, whose responsibility is it then? to make sure that that family's choice is respected in the classroom. Ultimately, it's the family's choice to communicate the um, demand, request, um, expectation to the child. Um, I would suggest they communicate with the teacher and we will do our best to remind the child, but it's not the school's place to enforce a home decision. If a child has an identified medical need or a particular plan guiding um, their time at school, I would say there'll be a higher level. There will need to be a higher level of um, vigilance there. But I don't think it's appropriate to expect the teachers to be um, the mask police throughout. But I think it's reasonable to ask them to keep an eye on things and give gentle reminders when they can. Okay, so when we say it's a family choice, maybe what we what we're meaning is it's a it's a student's choice to implement it at school. I will leave that to mom, dad, or mom and mom, or dad and dad to decide. You know whether it's a choice for the child or not. I I, I think compliance may be determined differently in different families. Thanks. 
Anyone else have a question for Pam? So Pam, actually, this is Ken, a question on just currently data and we're kind of switching from, I, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, we were talking a lot about the schools, the, the school community, the teachers, the students, and really communications. And there was a lot on rates and, and the stress to that. I guess I would ask as we move forward into this this new period, um, the, the questions come up, you know, it's, and I, I've been reminded, I remember back in the good old days when it was only lice or somebody getting the flu or the throw up bug in the classroom when um, we are, how do we, you know, how do we track this or how do we know what's going on in the classroom? Um, how, I guess, what, what measures are in place or what resources do the health teams in the school have in terms of being able to manage kind of in the, the post, not even, I won't call it post masking. There's a whole bunch of controls that were laid out that have changed over the course of the past few years, vaccination, ventilation, um, distancing, hand hygiene, testing. I guess what metrics or what management tools kind of remain after the masking? Because the masking was one layer of many. All of our cleaning protocols are still in play. Mm -hmm. What the discussion yesterday was enlightening to hear, and you, you kind of know this commonsensically, is that with the move to at-home testing, even our monitoring is taking a step back and it's reliant on self-reporting at this point. So we're still going to continue to keep our COVID dashboard going, but on the call yesterday, it was pretty clear that at the town level, the state level, everyone's struggling with people who are choosing to report versus choosing not to report their COVID positives and whether or not they're true COVID positives based on the test that they're taking is now in question. So I think what I learned from our conversation yesterday and listening, listening to people who know much more about this than I do, that that desire to want to control, monitor, enforce needs to start to transition into trust um, and self-responsibility. So if you're still in a place where you're feeling very concerned about COVID, you should be continuing to mask. And we all welcome that. We all, you know, we'll all make our personal decision there. And that the one-way masking, if you are using that KN95, is 95% effective more so than some of the cloth masks, you know, double cloth masking situations we're in now. So I think monitoring and compliance are sliding backward and personal responsibility and community responsibility are stepping up. As you know, contact tracing has been eliminated um, and we aren't uh, recording vaccine and we don't have a vaccine mandate for either children or um, adults in the state of Massachusetts. Anyone else have questions? Sarah, I have I have, I have a couple quick questions before we discuss an actual motion. So, yep. uh, Pam, can you speak to kind of related to what Ken was saying about other mitigation efforts? Where this leaves us with our mitigation efforts of distancing, and if we need to have that conversation, and when, and also um, other activities that make school feel normal that that some people might have preferred happened even before um, mask mandates were relaxed, like allowing parents back into the school buildings and that sort of thing. Could you comment on either of those? I think the three foot distancing to, you know, if you would go by the letter of the DESE guideline, it's when possible. So there have been situations and as, you know, kids are playing sports, kids are mingling, or we're not always within those three foot guidelines. So we could choose to formally lift it um, but that currently isn't being enforced statewide. So it's just something that's been our rule of thumb since the beginning of the year that whenever possible, we maintain three feet. I don't think we have, I mean, I don't see a need to push off of that just yet. Um, I think it's achievable without any major disruption in classrooms. Um, but I do think there are instances at lunch when kids want to sit together in a traditional setting. Um, where I know that high schools have gone there on the Cape Ann League, there was a survey that went out. So we can, if we want to hold firm to the three feet, we can, if we want to relax it, I will leave it up to the committee and we can reiterate that point. Um, all the cleaning protocols are still in play and we'll continue to um, encourage good hygiene and stay at home when sick. Okay, 
that that helps because I am interested in if, if we're going to be removing a mitigation effort or making it optional, let's do one at a time so that we know if it's working or not. Right? So that we're not conflating issues here and then how about the encouragement of. Um, schools to be on a similar path toward activities back to normal. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Okay. Just interesting. Thanks. So I, I had one further question, maybe Pam, to move us to the point of emotion that you alluded to when you talked about aligning with the DESE guidance and things that are dynamically changing. Um, talking about eliminating, basically eliminating, and I think you mentioned three options, not to pin you down because it's something we get to discuss, but it'll help us springboard. Um, eliminate just kind of going with no mask mandate the 28th when the states expire as we expire, waiting a week or waiting a, two weeks after. And knowing kind of some of the connections, what you've heard, do you mind giving a little bit of background on what you've heard and what what kind of prompted you to share those options? Yes. We have neighboring districts who are going on the 28th, the 7th, and the 14th. I think there is a feeling among some, and I, I'm going to be very clear, it's a feeling that waiting a week or waiting two weeks post break will give us some indication of whether or not there'll be another surge. Um, there have been districts statewide who did the 80% roll back late fall and have been going through Omicron um, without major incident, right? Nobody's backed off of it. They've been unmasked for some time. Um, some will point to the fact that there is no conclusive evidence that there has been um, that the vacations necessarily contribute to the surge. And I think common sense shows differently because of travel, but that could play out differently in different communities based on the rate of, I mean, so there's like a whole lot of emotion and feeling around it in discussing it with the health group yesterday. And we had three members on that call who should please feel free to jump in with what they heard. I can tell you what I think I heard is that extending it to either the 7th or the 14th may ease the transition for some but it isn't necessarily gonna have a material impact on whether or not um, removing masking causes a surge or not. It just, there's no way to tell, but it may make us feel better about stepping into it. Thank you for that, Pam. On those lines, Pam, um, I know that we saw the numbers going up after Christmas break, but I also know that that coincided with um, Omicron. Did we see numbers go up after Thanksgiving? I'd have to go back. I didn't pull that for this slide, but I can go back and look. Um, not, nothing consequential. What you can see on this slide is you see full semester one versus full semester two. So I, you know, I'm happy to pull it up on a separate screen and see if I can uh, answer that question for you. But this is gonna show you where we are. Um, our full report to do in tomorrow afternoon. But the numbers are, you know, are coming down considerably. But let, let me see if I can pull that for you, Kate. What, well, can I also you're clarify one thing while you're doing that, um, just based on some of the, the commentary, that this, this is, I just want to make it absolutely clear for all of us that well, masking is still encouraged, especially among the unvaccinated, and that this that voluntary masking um, in particular is not going to be discouraged in any way. And I, I especially want to clarify that staff are not going to be, and teachers are not going to be asked not to wear masks for any reason whatsoever. That's not part of this discussion, right? That, that we're gonna- Asked, asked not to wear masks? Yes, yeah, with, with one of the comments Right, revolving around concern about the teachers wearing masks and the impact on children. I want to make sure that we're clear that when we do this, teachers have every opportunity to choose to wear masks, and there will be we're not trying to dissuade anybody from that. Okay, I just want to clarify. Okay. Yeah, uh, Pam, I wouldn't mind saying something quickly, uh, just for the members of the school community that weren't part of the health meeting yesterday. Uh, there were a few, I guess, things that were a bit surprising that came out of that meeting from some of the principals in terms of, you know, the reality in each of our schools. <clears throat> uh, but really a couple of things, um, you know, 1, I, I think it was. 
pretty clear from that meeting to me that, you know, masks are far from the only mitigation effort that we've had in our public schools over the past, uh, you know, year or year plus. And um, the other kind of, I guess, not really surprising, uh, you know, I, I basically knew this, but um, even during the Delta surge and the Omicron surge this year, um, we didn't have a single confirmed case of transmission within our schools, which is pretty amazing. And I think that speaks to a couple of different things. One, uh, you know, the job that, you know, our teachers, our health team, our nurses, and the public, uh, you know, all the parents of school-aged children in both Manchester and Essex, uh, the amazing job that they've done, you know, working to help us, the school committee's main goal, which has always been to keep as many students in school, in person as possible, right? That, that's always been our goal. Uh, and, and that's our main driving goal with, with the decisions that we've made over the past year here. Um, and I say that it was a bit surprising that we haven't had any transmission when I heard the realities of, you know, how lunch is being handled at for different schools and, you know, how, you know, and, and again, this is expected, but, you know, masks do fall down uh, and especially in younger children, they don't always fit so well. And, you know, there's a lot of nuances there. So the fact that we still haven't had any, uh, you know, track to transmission in our schools made me feel very comfortable or even more comfortable with the decision that Desi made. And then my final thing is that, um, you know, as a school community, I think I would just highly encourage us to still continue to align as we always have with what the DESE guidelines are and guidelines from our town board of health, as well as the guidelines from our uh, health team here within the district. I do just want to note um, that I think that our the health team meeting started yesterday with one of the school nurses saying that um, she was really concerned about dropping the masks as soon as we got back from February break. And I would echo that concern. Um, I am like you, Chris, I am so excited and so relieved that we have had such little school spread. And I think that we can credit the mitigation, um, the mitigation efforts in our schools with limiting that school spread. Um, and I think that masking obviously has has had a lot to do with that. You know, we have no data about what a school with 60% vaccination rate will look like without masks. Can I make one comment for the committee be, based on that that meeting yesterday to another surprising thing? Chris, I joined you that a couple of things were surprising coming out of that, but I will say the most surprising thing to me was the um the um the lack of urgency in terms of that weak buffer that that when the conversation started it seemed like like um joanne came in saying uh, seaman came in saying that 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 buffer time would be needed and then by the end <laughs> it was looking like um that need is based more on on desire i really expected to hear our public health people saying give it a buffer zone yes move forward with this but give it that buffer zone and i specifically didn't hear it and and was asking about it and so that is something that was surprising to me and has given me cause for reflection today um that came out of our health team meeting yesterday yeah but it's not it's not just our health team that didn't recommend that it's also desi that didn't recommend that it's also you know well, our I'm specifically talking about our health team because that's who yeah we relied on to make the decisions in the past. And, and Teresa, I'll be honest, I won't speak for them, but I will speak for myself that the, originally the concept of the buffer, which I was having active conversations about, really was to provide an on-ramp for people, mm -hmm. a transition point. Yeah. Um, but in listening to the conversation yesterday, it was pretty clear that what, a transition point to what based on what how will you determine at the end that the transition was successful in the numbers that you saw in that we don't dictate going forward so unless we're going to design our a whole set of local metrics to govern how we're going to make the decision about when we should cut over 
it's really about creating a transition that would make people feel good. And I think what we were saying was, well, we would turn to the Board of Health to give us direction on how should we measure whether it should be a week or two weeks or three weeks. And that's where the conversation swung back to, well, it can be now because that's what the data is showing us now. We just lifted the mask mandates. So yeah, I, I think just... that's how we talked ourselves around to, well, I guess at this point, there's really no, there may not be a reason to delay. Yeah, it just was a surprise, that's all, yeah. So I, I just, I guess, I just wanna offer a couple of comments because I know we still have close to 200 people on. I just wanna detail just a couple of thoughts and comments. Number one, I wanna thank everybody. This, I think I've received more emails. I think the school committee has in the past probably week um, with very well thought out comments, suggestions, um, the full range of emotions on both sides of the issue that I think I have in the previous six years here. Um, and I wanna, it's, it's been interesting and important. This has weighed heavily, I know, on all of us. Um, I haven't been in contact with folks, but I know a lot of you hearing your comments, you've been going through similar, <laughs> similar thought processes that I have, that we're in this here to kind of serve the district as a whole, everybody from our most vulnerable people to those who are just saying, I'm done with it, you know, I don't, I don't care, wear your mask. Um, and I think it's been important. The one thing that's guided me through the pandemic, we always say, what do we do that's best for the, for the kids? What do we want to be doing that's right for the community? And there's a piece of this that's become apparent the past couple of weeks that this is almost a little bit, it's going to be great to take the masks off. My ears are hurting just from nine hours earlier into work today. Um, but at the same time, behaviorally, we got to make sure everybody comes through it together. Um, the last contextual piece is, there's the cascade of none of us on this board are, are health experts or especially population public health experts. We're operating on the advice of all, but I, I guess I would say um, we tend to think of things as, okay, what do we need to do locally to make things happen? And sometimes people use that for passing the buck down. I was like, hey, I'd really like Pam and individual teachers and everybody to make the decisions on what do we need within a given classroom within a given school. Um, that passing the buck, I don't think we can do. We have to make some decisions here tonight but I do want to, I guess, ask Pam, in terms of just dealing with the change and where people are at, this is going to be a behavioral change. It's going to be uplifting for some and terrifying for others. Um, we have three days left of a school week and then a five-day break, five-day school break with lots of travel and lots of people doing other stuff. Last time we had a break this long over Christmas, we came back to, I had relatives and friends falling sick and being hospitalized and everything else. I guess, where do, you, where do you think the schools are at, Pam? And that'll be the end of my editorializing on it. In terms of dealing with kids returning after a week or a day or whatever without masks. Schools reflect their communities. And we are in the same place as the rest of Manchester and Essex, the rest of the North Shore. People, you said it, people are excited and people are fearful. And I think that's the hard part of the shift to the personal responsibility, which is you're now go we now have to help people get to the point of being able to meet it based on what their own personal need is, but not control the entire environment um, for them. So I think we have mixed emotions. And I think like every other new venture we go into, we are going to try to be thoughtful and helpful, but we're gonna have to continue to move forward. Thank you. Reframe the time, re reframe the, the phrase personal responsibility model, the moving toward personal responsibility model, because it and, and somehow we incorporate the idea of, you know, personal choice for community responsibility, because I mean, it's, it's how we interact in support of keeping one another safe. It's, it's our own personal choices, but I just, I, I don't know that in our district and everything we're learned, we've learned through the vision of the graduate process. Let's think about me is 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 the language we want to use. How about how can my choices impact others and helping people Enough. make those kinds of choices? Well said, Teresa. All right. Does somebody want to um, get a motion on there so we can move on this? Yeah, I would like to make a motion to uh, vote to approve the recommendation of the Board of Health as Pam had outlined in you know, what she presented today. Okay, um, and would you like your 
a motion to be that we align with the Department of Education and Secondary Education's recommendation that we end the mask mandate on the 28th? Correct. Okay, is there a second for Chris's motion? I would second that. This is Eric, um, and I didn't have a chance to comment, but I think that, you know, all along <clears throat> we have kind of trusted our health experts to guide us and also aligned ourselves with DESE. Um, I think, you know, voting to uh, remove the mandate as of the 28th would be in keeping with that philosophy and um, with the understanding that, you know, anyone still definitely has the option to wear masks if they choose to and if they feel like that gives them uh, an extra layer of safety. So that would be my vote. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I would definitely, um, my, uh, contribution to this. I would definitely encourage people who are feeling nervous or who do have um, health concerns to feel comfortable continuing to wear their mask, whether you're a student or a teacher. Um, I don't think we will tolerate anybody teasing children or being mean to people who are wearing masks uh, in school. And also, I would just really encourage everybody to take advantage of those tests that are going home for free. They were so hard to find over Christmas vacation. We're sending them home. So if, you know, especially if people are traveling over the vacation week, maybe take an extra test just to be sure, make sure that you, you know, if you have a sniffle or even if you don't have a sniffle, if you are in a crowded place, um, let's just do our best to keep everybody <clears throat> healthy as we return back to school. Um, that that is what I would say. Um, I do. I did promise. I wrote about a million and five emails today, and I promised everybody that we would listen to the recommendations from our from our health team. So, um, okay. So, uh, any discussion? We have a motion on the table. Any more discussion? I have some discussion. Um, I just want to note that our, I I find some of the recommendations from the health team to be contradictory. So we've said that we will align with CDC guidance. The CDC guidance continues to recommend that students will wear masks in classrooms. Um, Pam has said that, that we anticipate this being updated in the next couple of weeks. I hope that it is because I would like to be able to rely on that guidance. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that students should be wearing masks at school. Um, our own board of health who participated in the health call yesterday seems to be indicating that their um, judgments on this had more to do with um, optics and um, some, some issues that were less um, aligned with, with um, health, health and safety and more aligned with politics. And that was concerning to me. Um, I will say again that the school nurse who participated yesterday started our meeting off by saying that she thought that it would be foolish to take the masks off the week coming back from February break. I want the masks gone. I think that it's hasty to do it the week after everyone has been traveling. I think that it's hasty to do it the week after everyone has been traveling, particularly in schools where our vaccination rate is still 65% and where we only have one third of the school population participating in the, the optional testing. Um, I don't know what mitigation efforts we are left with. If we are not masking, we are allowing people to choose whether they test or not. We have below the recommended um, percentage of vaccinations to establish any kind of herd immunity. Um, I think that we're leaving ourselves open to um, potentially some kids getting sick and potentially some kids getting very sick. I'm not opposed to dropping the masks. I want the masks gone. I think that this timeline is hasty. Teresa. I have um, some motion specific um, commentary also, um, but can I just clarify, Kate, tell me if I'm mischaracterizing this, but I just want to clarify for the people listening to when you talk, when you're talking about what we heard in the meeting yesterday and some of the, the things looking more like it had to do with optics and politics. I, I think that what I'm hearing you referring to also is the, is the idea that they have to be looking forward toward if there's another wave, 
having something to be able to work with and therefore giving a little right now so that people, so that compliance will go with that. I, that was my takeaway in terms of that part of it. And I just wanted to make, see if that's what you were referring to also, because if so, I just want to make sure people are hearing that they're looking at it in a broader way. And that's why, rather than it being politics of like appease people in, in that. I, I would agree with you, Teresa, but I would also add that there were um, concerns about um, compliance, I think, especially in the middle and high school, um, at the middle oh, and high right. school levels, and oh, that okay. it would be difficult to enforce. And I think, you know, I think that. I, I'll I, offer two I things. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Kate. Go ahead. I was trailing off. <laughs> you go, Pam. I was going to say, Joanne Seaman is uh, the nurse we keep referring to, and she is on um, the call. And I think she'd be willing to just speak and say how she's feeling about things now after our conversation. I don't want to put her on the spot. And then I'm happy to speak to the compliance issue because that's a very real challenge for us. So I'll let Joanne go first. And then Sarah, can we come back though? Because I did have an actual topic to bring up. Okay. So I just want to explain yesterday when we were talking at first about what we wanted, I think we all have to understand we've been through two years of this. So the thought of getting rid of the mass, we were getting hit with tons of phone calls from staff and families that were concerned. And my job as the health person is to express those concerns, um, which I did by saying, I think we should wait a week. After talking with the Board of Health and um, our school doctor and other members of the health team, there's really no reason to put it off for two weeks. It's not going to show us anything different. It, I think the fact that we're going to test on those two dates, and I strongly urge people to take advantage of getting these tests, um, will give us some evidence. Um, I, I think everybody needs to know deep down inside that if the numbers go up, if things change, the mass will change, they'll go back. Um, but people who are worried about masks, wear them. Um, otherwise, I, I think it's all good. I really feel that it's time. And um, I'm sorry if I confused people yesterday, um, but I was speaking from trying to get everybody's point of view. And um, I don't think it's gonna matter waiting a week or two. I think we should drop it on the 28th. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. All right, Teresa, back to you, because I know you were in the middle of your um, comment. If Pam, did you want to say something? Because mine's I, on a separate note. I mean, it's about I this. just wanted to follow up on the compliance issue. And, you know, we don't talk about it a lot because we have been working with the guidelines that are in place. But for building level people, for the nurses, enforcement of this compliance is difficult. We have people who are very who are equally passionate and uncomfortable wearing the masks and are going to offer counter perspectives as to why it's doing damage in a mental health realm. So there are, you know, there are arguments on both sides and we have been put right in the middle and put in the position of having to enforce external regulations. And it has not been easy work for anyone. So I think when the principals spoke honestly about the difficulty of getting people to comply with something, when all public indicators are saying there is no basis for you to force this compliance is a very real concern about something that will take up much time and energy throughout the day. So I, I think they were just being honest and putting on the table um, a reality that we have had to face. Um, and we'll be honest to say are looking forward to not being in that position going forward. Teresa, did you want to? Yeah, then my actual point. Okay. Um, so it's like we're back to square one at the beginning of remote learning. Desi says one thing and we have to see how it implements and how it works for our district. You know, first, they're going to tell us how to do it. And then they say, no, it's up to you guys to decide. And so um, we're back to square one with all the, um, you can find studies or articles or whatever to support whatever your personal brand of, of support on this is. I think we have a real opportunity here to get out of the business of medical decisions um, as much as possible. 
and include language in this motion, whether we use the MASC language or not, but tie um, anything moving forward to decisions by our local boards of health. Because one thing that came out of the meeting yesterday that we haven't talked about at all is um, a definite um, encouragement. I noticed, especially from um, Essex boards of health, board of health um, representatives there. Um, to be looking and include something about, well, what if we have to do this again? How is that going to be determined? Are we, are we going to have our own metrics? Where, how are we going to do this? And we have an opportunity in this language to include that if one or both, how, what are we going to do? We at least have to discuss this. If one or both of our member towns reverts back to a mask mandate, we've got to follow this. So, or, I mean, if it's municipal building, so how are we going to handle that if one or both of our member towns does that maybe we include that language that that that's the determining factor for us obviously any state mandate would would supersede that anyway but pam are you are you hearing what i'm saying i am hearing what you're saying and i think we i just pulled up the slide where we had built that in yesterday which is uh this is based on current guidance from desi and will be revisited in the event of new guidance issued or local boards of health mandates. Okay, so I'm I'm suggesting that we not revisit it. I'm suggesting that if there's a local board of health mandate, that's that is our basis for for doing or not doing, so that that we're not doing this every time something new comes up. If I remember, yes. yeah, yeah, if I remember, yeah, if I remember, didn't the board of health? Because I I listened to the Manchester board of health meeting their their mask uh, lifting their mask mandate. And they were hesitant, hesitant specifically to, you know, they tried almost not to give us guidance, if, if I remember correctly, on that Board of Health meeting, saying that it is the purview of the school committee to make those decisions. With that being said, I couldn't encourage us more to, you know, if an emergency meeting is needed, you know, if the situation changes with COVID, and especially I remember, you know, if a uh, new variant emerged that was more contagious or resulted in a higher hospitalization level or, or higher rate of death than previous variants that we would almost immediately consider this. You know, I, I do think we should, you know, I, I do think the language is already in there, I guess. And I'd like, I I'd like to, um, I'd like to actually amend the motion. <clears throat> okay. So the motion that we have right now is that we, and our, our re, we rescind our previous mask mandate as of the 28th <clears throat> to be reinstated <clears throat> in the case of a local board of health mask mandate in the towns or new guidance from the Department of Education and Secondary Education. I think if the towns are masking, the school should be masking. They're pretty reluctant to put that mask mandate in. If they're doing it, then I think that we should be doing it. I agree, I agree Sarah, I would... but I think that we should think about the fact that our teachers are coming from other towns and our staff members are coming from other towns and um, we're serving a population that's primarily children. So if there were a variant, I mean, let's all hope that it never happens, but if there were a variant that was more dangerous to children than the general public, I can see us having a different, um, potentially needing to have other layers of protection separate from the general public. And that's that's exactly what I'm, what I'm proposing we get out of the business of, is because then we're in the same spot of doing this over and over again. I think if a new variant emerges that's so, um scary that the um that we're worried about like teachers coming from another town and bringing it and sharing it with our children that if that's circulating that the towns would be implementing a mask mandate locally that's my feeling now i would also envision if there was something that emerged I, i'm kind of thinking what happened over the holiday break which is there was something emergent there was a concern based on reports that the commissioner was getting from his health advisors and his medical team, and they started to activate a plan for return. You know, if something changes drastically in the next seven days and we're, you know, getting called into session on Thursday because there's something happening, they will adjust guidance and issue emergency orders. We right. want to craft something that allows us to just move freely with those 
to Teresa's point and not necessarily have to come back and analyze what has been done each and every time. Yeah, so Is if we have it to move right. with either DC or the local town mandates, I think that covers it. So either of the towns, because sometimes there are a couple days off on their on their meetings too. So if one of our member towns implements a mask mandate, that we will follow suit. We can always meet emergency meeting or whatever, or post it for 24 hours and whatever the posting of meeting and decide ourselves at that point. We could vote. Sarah, can you take the question from Eli Bowling? Oh. I I can't see a question from Eli. I saw his hand go up. I don't know if it was accidental. Oh, I'm sorry. I can only see like three hands. Um, sure. I would like to recognize. Nice Eli Bolding, who's the um, a selectman in Manchester. Hi, I'm um, sorry. I just wanted to um, clarify one thing about the uh, Board of Health's position the other day. Um, the Board of Health actually was deferring to the school committee um, based on a couple of things. One, and, and I think the critical aspect was that your circumstances are different from the, the municipal circumstances. So the municipality makes decisions based on what the exposure might look like in restaurants or, or um, uh, supermarkets and, and, and you have a different set of circumstances. So the Board of Health made a point of um, <clears throat> deferring to you to make decisions based on your specialized circumstances. So I am not sure that you should turn around and defer to our boards of health. I think that it might be a better idea for you to make independent decisions based on your own specialized circumstances. Okay, thanks, Eli. You know what, I think maybe we should just leave the boards of health out of it and just leave it at, um, we will align with guidance from Desi. Then, then I have to say this in that conversation yesterday and in a subsequent conversation today, the, then we need to be clarifying what metrics we would be using going forward. So we're just saying that at our whim, we might choose to reinstate this. So that's what I'm saying. I think we're going to align ourselves with Desi. So, so we won't ever be implementing a mask mandate outside of a Desi state mandate again. That's what I think. That's what it says. So if our met, I just want to be clear, because so I'm understanding if our member towns come to the table with with a municipal building mandate before Desi says schools have to have them, we're still staying masks optional. I just I just want to make sure I'm understanding what this is before it happens. I don't know if the municipal building mandate applies to the schools in the regional school district or not. And I think we're getting really bogged down in this discussion. And I think maybe what we need to do is have the vote. Sorry, you're freaky. Is have the vote to um, just have the vote to rescind the mask mandate on the 28th. And then I think that maybe our policy subcommittee should meet and decide what they want the pot, what we should have, not decide, but should present us with what exactly we want to craft for a policy moving forward in case of further developments. So, so Sarah, Sarah, sorry, go sorry, ahead, Ken. Katie. All right, I'll go in, Sarah, just real quickly to go on this. Um, first off, I wanna thank Joanne and Eli for speaking up. Um, again, there's been a lot of perspectives on it and I especially respect. Joanne's, I, I, I am definitely torn on this. I still do have concerns on people in the community, you know, and members, whether it's the teachers or the rest, there's a pragmatic engineer part of me that says, oh, geez, you know, we've been struggling with teacher absences and filling holes where people can't come in or because of their situation or their family situation. I'm hoping this doesn't affect that. And I think it's overall, we're all moving into this new world together. So I'm hoping that's not there. But I also do think, hope with Pam that, um, again, kind of Teresa and Kate's comments about we're a community that whatever we whatever we come out of this on, we can at least spend the next few days in the schools before break 
talking about what's going on and how we're moving forward together because I don't want this to be a, I, I have very distinct memories of fourth grade, some of you similar vintage of the school prayer. And I remember being different from the other kids in my class and which side I was on. I don't remember which side I was on, but I remember the stress of going in and being like, oh, it's going to feel so different the next day. And I just hope that we can address that for those of, for everybody who's gone through the change. Well, my last comment, sorry. I think of Kate, who's, or Teresa, who's yours. I just wanted to reiterate that the last time we had an extended break, we saw a surge in our populations and our communities directly afterwards. We are now going back to school after an extended break. We are removing the last really of our universal mitigation strategies um, because the remaining strategies are opt-in strategies that um, significant numbers have not opted into, especially at the elementary level. And we are also saying that at the elementary level, teachers will not be responsible for enforcing a family's choice. I think that that leaves families in a really difficult position, especially for that one or two week buffer when we are still waiting to see how February break plays out. And, and I just want to say that um, a couple of things, just, just so everyone on the school committee knows, I know I haven't had the opportunity to necessarily meet everyone in person, but, um, you know, masking is a very important mitigation effort. It works extremely well. It's one of the reasons why we've had, you know, no transmission in schools that we've recorded. Not, you know, not little transmission. There's been no transmission. Um, I also think, you know, I personally have three uh, conditions listed on the comorbidities list for COVID, you know, by the CDC. So I am at higher risk. It's part of the reason why I was able to get vaccinated early on um, and boosted early on. <clears throat> um, but I'm not making this decision based off of, you know, my personal situation. I'm making my decision based off of the guidance that DESE has issued, and I just personally believe that they have taken a lot of these. Uh, the thoughts that we are debating today, I believe that they have taken those into consideration because I do believe that they have er, you know, erred on the side of caution and safety, you know, during the entire pandemic. So that that's kind of my last uh, statement on this. Thank you. Does anybody have final wording on this motion that I've butchered with all of my stabs at trying to amend in a way that would make it make sense? So, so are we amended or unamended, Sarah? <sighs> Can you just reread the, the final verdict? I don't know if we need to ask Chris or whoever else. I think it's just, I think we should do, um, can we just vote to just have a nice clean recent rescind our current policy? And then go back and wordsmith what we want our new policy to be. We've got the MASC one on the table, but we can't just implement it when we haven't all necessarily read it. So, like, let's go back and read the MASC one and think about how we want to roll with either if the towns implement a town mandate for their buildings or if we want to just roll with DESE and we can figure that out at our next meeting, but maybe just have our uh, vote to. Re to rescind the one that's on the table right now. That's what I would like. give you a third option too. You don't necessarily have to have any type of masking policy. I mean, you could simply rescind and choose to align with Desi guidance on COVID and issues of masking. Well, let's at least look at the one that the MASE offered. Let's have the policy committee look at that one. But in the meantime, we have a motion on the table. So I think we're ready to go ahead and vote on the motion on the table. Remind um, me the motion on the table table please <laughs> just to rescind the current mask policy so that as the of, children hmm? as, of as, when. Of, as of the 28th that's what's on the table okay eric yes matt yes kate no chris yes Teresa. yes Ken? You go first, Sarah. <laughs> no, that is so unfair. It's really hard. I'm kidding. Yes, it is hard. Um, I'm going to have to vote yes, so we go with rescind. 
I'm a yes because I promised that I would go along with what the boards of the health said to do. That's where I am too. I have all of Kate's concerns and and I have all of I have all of the concerns and yep. I think it's no secret my soul has been bared. I think everybody in both towns knows um that I'm a pretty scared of covid kind of person. Um so I will continue to wear my mask. Um but I do think it's going to be okay. You know, the most reassuring voice I know is Joanne Siemens. We've been through a lot together. We've been through a negotiation cycle together. She was my friend. We shared a box of tissues that was pre COVID. Um, I find her the most reassuring person I know. So that for her to tell me that it's okay and that it's not going to make a difference to wait the extra week, I trust, um, I trust our school nurses. But I really want to thank all of the people who weighed in, whether you wanted us to take the masks off nine months ago or you wanted us to take the masks off today. 99.9% .9 of the people who wrote to me were very kind um, and respectful. Um, I, I hope that that will continue as we move forward in this new endemic world that we hopefully are entering together. Sarah, I just have to add a quick PSA public service announcement at the end of this. It has been. I know what PSA stands for. I have teenagers. Well, I was going to say, I'm, I'm an older male, so it has other acronym, <laughs> but so there's, there are, um, there are, this is a good time to point out that decisions like this, there are a couple open school committee seats, I believe for Manchester. And so for a lot of the folks that were involved in it, even though I see the number dropping from 200, um, I hey, urge beg people to stay on for our budget discussion, please. Yes, and people, people that actually are staying on, which is good. So I'm sorry, Pam. I just saw a little bit. Um, this is part of the discussions as it's critical to really keep the schools going. So, um, in terms of the engagement and the involvement, it was really reinvigorating and rejuvenating to see folks that, like you, like you said, Sarah, 99% of the folks were very articulate and very considerate and, and engaged. So this is what makes school committee worth serving on. So consider running this year. But back to you, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's it on masking for tonight. We're gonna move into our budget discussions now. Okay. Let me uh, get that slide deck up. Would anyone from the subcommittee like to Give the update now as to where we are, and then I will kind of pull up the slides. Matt was going to give it. Yeah, Am I wrong? Was, no, that's okay. Um, <laughs> no, the update was just going to be simply we um, we once again met as sorry I was eating a little bit of ice cream there. Um, uh, we once again met uh, today uh, as a collaboration committee, which I think has been. We've been pretty faithful to kind of meeting on a regular basis because I know one of the biggest concerns last year was kind of to make sure that um, all the appropriate subcommittees and the selectmen had the information that they needed to bring back to the constituents so that um, informed informed decisions could be made and that the towns could be as um, as educated as they needed to be uh, prior to the town meetings and the votes. So. Um, I know we're going to get into some of the weeds here, so we don't have to get too deep into that, but that's that's kind of the most recent 1 is that we, um, we kind of continue to look at a uh, combination of potential cuts, uh, potential uses of reserves and kind of gaming out all those different scenarios to see which 1 potentially makes the most sense uh, to not only looking at this year, but also looking at the future to make sure that um, the budget and the process is sustainable for the long term. I have some, I was on the collaboration meeting this morning and I think that it's really awesome because, um, well, first of all, I was so sorry to hear that um, people have been bothering Nina after her comment. Her comment in the Gloucester Daily Times was just that they just wanted to see more information and they wanted to see what the cuts would be. Um, so we've been showing what the cuts would be to get to the various levels that we've been asked to come down to. Um, but I'm really glad because uh, side effect of COVID silver lining is that the Manchester um, town has moved their town meeting back a little bit, which means that we get an extra week or two to continue the discussion, which is great because it always is so hard when it feels like it's very, very rushed. And sometimes we present information and then the town committees maybe don't have an opportunity to meet in the weeks after we've presented that information. Um, so 
here we are again tonight and we're going to share the information again and talk some more about what the options might be and that gives everybody who are the decision makers in the towns a little more time to digest um, what they're actually asking of us and um, what the implications for the district will be. So let's get into it. I wish we had more time so we could give all of the participants tonight the real big background on the budget because we're kind of diving in on a couple of um, specific points of the budget building process that are driving this discussion about uh, reductions and cuts um, in use of reserves. So I'm just going to recap for us to kind of set the table. Um, you know, the last year we were having this, we were having the exact same conversation that we're having now, which is why we're probably finding it somewhat frustrating in that we started to raise the concern that um, the way we build the budget in our goal to live between three and a half and 4% with always aiming for a three and a half percent assessment rate for the towns puts us in this perpetual structural challenge of artificially suppressing the natural growth rate, which eventually has a cumulative effect of catching up and creating the need for an override. And our goal is usually eight to 10 years um, between the 28% increase in insurance about six years ago, and then the COVID expenses. And what we're seeing is a pretty significant rise in out of district placements um, we are finding ourselves, we were finding ourselves on that doorstep last year. So we were starting to signal that, uh, we had a real concern about, um, being able to maintain our budget goals without having to make cuts. And we started some preliminary discussions about, you know, potential cutting last year, but the decision was to hold the program together. So we're carrying forward this structural problem into this year and then layering on, um, a new issue, which, uh, both Guy and Ben uh, mentioned in their comments up front. And so for the school committee, you're kind of faced with the decision of how do we balance the budget this year to manage what potentially could come in, in the out years. So um, FY24 and FY25, should we not be able to achieve an override? So we've got our structural financial challenge. We've got the expanded obligations of health care and uh, retiree insurance. Uh, Retiree insurance and uh, district placements this year, which accounts for a direct add to our annual growth rate of six hundred thousand uh, dollars, six hundred forty thousand dollars to be exact. And then the enrollment shift that's causing an apportionment current concern for the town of Essex, and that's again what Ben and Guy were talking about, which is even though we may hit our target goal, which has historically been three and a half percent assessment. Once it's run through the apportionment formula, it's creating a number higher than that for the town of Essex because the town of Essex has grown as a proportion of the district, meaning it's still smaller um, heads wise than Manchester. But in terms of their percentage of the whole, as the Manchester numbers um, decline, as the bubble classes move out, Essex becomes a little bit bigger. So their share of the bill grows. Um, and that is what's putting some pressure on them now. Uh, we had presented since tentative budget a couple of different ways um, that we could achieve the three and a half. Um, but what we learned was that that three and a half, again, wasn't me meeting Essex's need. So the ask was again to cut. Uh, so we've kind of scrapped both of those plans because it's pretty evident that to, should the committee choose to meet Essex's ask this year, of bringing them in lower in apportionment increase than they were last year, we would be looking at some really significant um, financial reductions and likely full-scale structural cuts over time. So what I'd like to do is just really get clear on what the problem we're trying to, what the problem is before we start to talk about the solutions. Again, historically, um, for those who are tuning in, we build a budget um, based on level services, meaning the staffing and the programs we have from one year carry forward to the next. And that grows typically about three and a half percent to about 4%. That's typically our spending growth. The spending growth then translates through one formula into an assessment for both towns, which then is split through the regional district apportionment formula. What Essex has been asking us to do is really come in the form of three separate asks. The beginning budget process, so in November when we build the tentative budget, we target for three and a half assessment. 
to achieve three and a half assessment, we would need to cut $983,000. And yes, when we go to solve the problem, we can cut, we can use reserves, we can come up with a couple of different mechanisms for addressing this. But the gap between what our real growth year over year is and what the number we're trying to achieve is, is $983,000. If we were to achieve that, and that's our gentle person's agreement between the school and the two towns of where we should try to target each year, Essex's apportionment would be 4.99%, 5% growth over last year. One ask last year and carried into the beginning of this year was, well, other town departments live at 2.5% annual growth rate. Why can't the school live at that? Well, we could try. And if we set our spending target at 2.5%, we would have to cut $905,000 to get to 3.8% growth rate or 5.32 for the town of Essex. So that's not going to solve the apportionment formula either. It actually pushes it up. If we go and try to hit the target that they asked us to hit in terms of town apportionment, so their percentage growth over last year for their portion of the bill, and we target that at 3.5%, we would need to cut $1,340,000 worth of services, spending increase of 0.9, assessment of, of 2%. The number they're asking for is somewhere between 3.5 and 3.8 for this year. So what you can see is we're looking at a significant reduction package for the district, or using 50% of our reserves with no understanding of how we're going to resolve this problem moving forward. So I think what we're trying to show in this exercise, and I probably made it more confusing than it is, is either of these, if you set our goal at either of these targets, we can't achieve it without some significant um, financial reductions or significant reserve use or a combination of the two. So the committee's left with the big decision of whether or not we meet the request and then how do we how do we do it if we're going to meet the request what's the right combination of things to do or do we not meet the request and go forward with the budget as is or is there a com compromise someplace in the middle and i can show you some scenarios about how we can get there but i think my recommendation to the committee is that Whatever decision we make this year needs to be guided by a commitment to a long term solution that if we're going to agree um, as a body to make cuts to help them meet their target apportionment goal. And we've never built a budget to meet an apportionment goal. But if we chose to this year, I do not think it would be smart to do so without some public commitment to what next year will bring in terms of support for an override and what that amount might be. And at this point, we are looking at approximately one and a half million dollars just to right the ship of where we are this year. That's not taking into account any potential growth or expansion and out of district or health care for next year. And we're going to show you a couple of scenarios of what that could look like in a second. So this is the problem that you're wrestling with. So any questions on the problem that we're trying to address before we talk about solutions? Sarah? I don't have a question on the problem, but I just want to add a little bit to the history, which is okay. that last year when we were basically having the same conversation and the town of Essex had the, why can't you come in at two and a half like all the other town departments? I will totally own it. I was intransigent. I dug in my heels and I said, no, because it's the middle of a pandemic that is ruining the lives of our children, and we are going to give them all of the services we need, all boots on the ground, we need all of our resources possible. I think now we can take a deep breath, and I think that we should try to meet halfway for sure. Like, I think that we can have a little bit of a give, but I just, I just wanted to give that history. Um, so last year, we did not adjust. We adjusted a tiny bit, but we, we didn't adjust very much. And I was very adamant that we should not do that. And I, people are mad at me because of it. Um, so anyway, that's just the history. I'm just so 
So I had one question, Pam, before you move on in terms of defining the problem. Um, I want to be clear because I heard even earlier on in the call, somebody had asked, you know, why is it that our enrollment is going down, but our teachers are going up? I want to just speak to and be clear on is this a problem that's voluntarily of our own making? Are we adding teachers willy nilly because we like to, or can maybe you speak a little bit to that as to how we've ended up here and what we've added that's optional versus what we've added that's mandatory? Well, I'm going to give the brief answer tonight because we dedicated an entire meeting to exploring one of the reasons why our general enrollment is going down, but some of our staffing is going up. And that's January the 11th. We spent um, a good part of the evening. Uh, discussing our budget and as part of the budget, looking at um, our special education programming, how we approach it and um, what some of the embedded costs are with it. So what we talked about that night was um, the fact that we have invested a considerable amount of money um, in building in district program capacity for special education students. Um, those programs run at a 1 to 6 or 1 to 8 teacher to student ratio. And typically require additional personnel in the form of a 1 on 1 aid or specialty services to service the students. But by investing those additional heads um, in these programs, we are able to keep students in district and defer um, prevent um, out of district placements for programming that we can offer here to the cost savings of about 1 and a half million dollars overall. So, yes. There are, are heads increases in our budget because we have seen a shift from general education heads reductions within a flow into special education. If you um, take a look at a, our historic budget slide, uh, you'll see that over the past, let's see if I can get to that one quickly enough. Um, I believe this is it. The beginning in FY18, uh, we have had significant uh, reduction in general education staff, uh, specifically at Memorial School. The questions asked why the elementary schools? Well, that's the area where we've had the most significant enrollment reduction over the past five years. It was the first place that the bubble classes exited. And when they did, we began um, routinely uh, retiring positions through attrition. So when someone retired, if we had a kindergarten teacher retire, we didn't replace the kindergarten teacher, we reduced by a section. So from about F, uh, from about 2015, 16 to now, as, uh, Memorial Elementary School has gone from having 19 classroom sections down to 15, direct reduction in teacher heads and services in the general ed program. In Manchester Memorial and Essex Elementary once had each a librarian, each a technology teacher. They have now moved to having shared services wherever possible on a 60-40 split based on enrollment. So my direct answer to the enrollment question is, general ed enrollment has declined where possible. However, we have experienced reinvestment in need in special education, which has absorbed some of those cuts and just moved them to a different part of the ledger. And again, we address this specifically in response to that question on 111. This is the history of cutting in the history of budget gap uh, addressing. So I think what's important to, for everyone to hear is that going into tonight's discussion of how do you find 1.1 to $1.3 million in our budget, you need to know that that's done after a cumulative cut of $2.7 million, beginning back in FY18 when we have experienced a 28% um, after budget increase in healthcare and manage that without passing any of that cost forward to either town. I guess, I and I, Pam, thank you for the reminder. We also have actively, by creating those in-district programs, managed mm -hmm. to stay ahead of what could have been potentially higher cost increases mm -hmm. with tuition out of district rather than creating our own that can help. No, not thank specific, you very much. Sure, Ken, and not specific to Manchester, Essex, but special ed costs are projected to rise over the coming years statewide because of the COVID impact. The learning loss in the anticipation of higher ref referrals and um, need for evaluations and potential findings. So I'm not anticipating that's an area that's going to decline quickly. Pam, are any of those programs revenue generating? 
They are if we have um, capacity to take in tuition based students. And I believe we have two or three tuition based students at this point in time. It's, it's tricky. Um, it's not an application program. It comes by referral from SPED directors in the region. And it's really um, a mutual support approach where we have students who are placed in other public school programs where we may not have a cohort. Um, so it's a way of maintaining, it's a, it's a win-win because it, you generally go for cost of program, not a private school expense. Um, but when you're on the receiving end, it helps you defray the cost of the program that you're running. So Avi, how many current tuition and students do we have? Three. Yeah. Three? I make a very quick comment. I, I do believe someone mentioned COVID costs. I just wanna remind people that in addition to the reductions here, um, the entire cost of COVID, which is exterior to our budget since we have some new listeners, Tonight it was about 1.7 million dollars. None of that came through a special assessment to the towns. That was all absorbed through district funds and use of reserves. So um, that's another area where we have dipped into the piggy bank to keep the trains running without having to send a separate bill to, to the taxpayers. Okay, so we can take a peek at. Um, some scenarios that might help us get to, I think Sarah called it, what, what was your term for the, um, solution you are seeking? A compromise. Compromise. Thank you. I'm getting a little, it's, I can't believe it's 830. I'm getting a little brain dead. So I'm going to say that what I'm going to recommend is one of two things, a 50, 50 reserve reduction package for FY 23. If we can get a public commitment and some consensus around what that number will need to be for next year, this year. And if we can't get that commitment, then I'm going to suggest a more severe approach, which is a 2080, 20% uh, 20 reserves, 80% cuts package, which allows us to preserve more reserves for out years, not knowing what our future is going to be. Um, and for people who are tuning in, reserves are essentially a series of different um, accounts that we have. One is called an excess and deficiency account. That's um, a place where we can put uh, operation funds at the end of the year if we end in the black. We have a stabilization account um, that's dedicated to capital improvement projects. So I heard the question up front about um, uh, the replacement of Highland Field, and we'll talk to that. We'll speak to that in just a little bit. Um, but that was one of our major planned projects after the completion of the Essex Elementary Playground, which was funded through that fund. Um, we have our school choice fund, which when we <laughs> deplete stabilization, we would go to um, for capital projects. And then we have a small facilities revolving account from our rentals. Um, but we'll look at reserves in a second. Yep. Can I just ask one go ahead. It's Matt. Um, oh, I'm Matt. Just one clarifying question on that. You said that your recommendation is is either either this or that. So I guess I'm, I'm just clarifying that you you are recommending regardless of the approach for a reduction. Well, I'm going to show you why I don't see how we can get through this year without a reduction. Okay, thank because you. Because not to use a reduction would mean committing a million dollars in reserve funds this year to plug the hole in the budget. Can we yeah, also I'm show you the whole spread? I can show you the whole spread. So this may be small. I'll try to blow it up a little bit. Um, so if we assume the size of the problem is the number, the gap that we had at the tentative budget, which was nine hundred and eighty five thousand dollars, plus a potential increase in health care from our tentative budget of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, we have a, a gap of one point one three five. So that is the money we are looking to put into or take out of the budget. So if you go with a scenario where you make no cuts and use all reserves, if that healthcare number goes up, you will need to take from our reserve accounts $1.135 million and put it into the budget. I think that would, would it have? I think it would take our reserves down to half. We can look at that in a minute. And that means next year it's we're going to be do or die. 
because the one in 1.135 will likely grow. It grows every year. We'll show you that as well. Um, and if it grows and you're not successful in an override, you're left with very few resources and you're left with only cutting to do. On the, on the other end, you have a sense of what all that cutting would look like because we've taken out, we've, we found a path to get to a million dollars in cuts um, and no reserves. I guess what I'm suggesting is that to get to the middle point, which would be this column, you would commit um, 568 in reserves, 568 in um, cuts and split the difference. Problem is that the difference doesn't really get Essex where it is asking to be. It gets them to 4.15 assessment. Pam, can I ask a quick question? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, Avi, could you also just cover for the board here uh, just what re you know what reserves are for the school system or the school district and how that could potentially affect things like our credit rating, you know, especially since we are you know considering some, you know, will be considering some large capital projects as well and how that could affect you know future costs across both of our communities. Sure. Well, at its simplest level, uh, reserve funds are rainy day funds, emergency funds. And they're they're one time in nature. They're not. There's not a recurring source of them. So whatever you spend, you don't make up or get back. It's you spend it and it's gone. Uh, uh, we had uh, when we went out to bond for the Memorial School project. We had our bonds rated by Standard and Poor's S and P, pretty well known international firm, uh, rated us, um, upgraded us to double A plus, second, right one step below triple A which is a reflection primarily of the three things they mentioned, good collaboration with the towns, management of reserve funds, and uh, good budgetary planning on a multi-year basis. And so we've been talking about this for multiple years, and what S&P will tell you is if, if you deplete that cushion, that rainy day fund to an unsustainable level, you know, you can start to look at a downgrade of credit rating. Uh, organizations with lower credit ratings have to pay higher interest on their bonds, and we uh, did a great job with enormous savings compared to what we uh, estimated when the Memorial School budget was proposed for the new school construction project. We know that there is a uh, capital need coming down the road uh, with Essex Elementary. And so absolutely, uh, whatever we take here is gonna come back to taxpayers in the form of an increase someplace else. So it, it may seem like uh, something it's an emergency now, use the emergency funds, but um, it, you spend now or spend later. And the same thing is true with capital needs, Chris, because we've identified and showed in some of our slides, we, we may have it in this deck, what we want to use those funds for from stabilization, for example, which is capital improvements, things that we need to do. Uh, these are things we should not be deferring. I know there's a question about the turf field earlier, and um, that's something that we absolutely would be doing this year. And the only reason it would be delayed is because we would have to do a another temporary patch so the field could be playable and needed safety rating. But you, at that point, you're putting you know, five figures of money into a field that's 13 years old. It's not a responsible use of taxpayer dollars. And at some point, it needs to be replaced anyway. Kind of like what we said with the Memorial School project. Why would you put a new roof on a school that you is already 60 years old? I think same thing is true with our stabilization fund. So we just need to be mindful. Whatever we use is it's a pay now or pay later. And later is coming to be very soon. As Pam was talking about, we're now into a you know one to two year type of scenario. And it's not for a lack of planning. We've been talking about our budget for several years now. Um, and so we're really just hitting a point where it's going to be a crisis if we don't deal with it proactively soon. Thank you, Avi. I think as you look at your options, you're going to see why, why we may need to defer it, even though it isn't the wisest long term move to make, because we're going to need all of our resources to kind of manage the decline. Um, so, as I said, I recommended, um, I'm going to recommend that we do a 50 50 if we get a commitment and an 80 20, which would be this column, the 850 to 85 split. 
um, if we don't get a commitment so that we can uh, preserve reserves to kind of manage manage the next couple of years, not knowing what the outcomes will be. Uh, not too much has changed on this list of how we would achieve it, other than to say we would need to um, be looking at, depending on where we land from right to left, two additional um, FTE reductions um, to hit the 50-50 mark and up to another uh, two or two and a half to hit uh, the 80-20 mark. The other position that we are going to um, eliminate next year would be uh, one, one high school math teacher, and we believe we will achieve that through attrition. Um, otherwise, it'll be just a direct cut. Uh, the other position uh, reduction stand, the other operations reduction stand, and we're going to push forward with restructuring of intervention in the in the future restructuring of administrative staff. Uh, we do need a year to a year. We need about six months to study this and come up with a recommendation that um, can be implemented over a timeline. Thoughts on direction to go. I've got a comment in here, Pam. Um, I'm going to go back to Sarah's point earlier, and I think you had a slide in here that showed kind of our use of reserves. Um, Sarah's point about how to go forward working in concert. And I just want to remind folks, I think it was in, um, 2018 or 2019, we had a similar situation we went into where Essex said we need to keep things down. And that was the beginning of our dip into reserves. And we've continued to dip into reserves. Um, I'm not calling out anybody in the town of Essex, the Board of Selectmen, FinCom. Um, but the issue is, is that the apportionment formula is there, things go on. We do our best on the school committee to react, but we have a duty to the students, as we heard earlier on this call. Um, and I know there's been the talk about getting commitment from Essex to respond. It's essentially budgets are year to year. Um, elected positions and appointed positions are in many cases year to year. There's really nothing that we have as a district to say, hey, you know, we're going to ask town A or town B to commit this next year other than a, a handshake agreement. So at the end, it's going to come down to really if we need the money, it's making the case to the citizens of the Manchester Essex Regional School District, the residents that support us. Um, I just want to, I guess, as I look at this, yeah, so this is where I think the bottom row where it's direct reserve usage, the 100, then building the 335 and 335. So we're on the path to eating away the reserves, and I don't see that we're going to be coming back. So at some point in time, we do need an override. Is It's inevitable. Um, I definitely do not want to cut services below. I think we heard from folks talking about the performing arts and the foreign language. Those are, I think, some of the few, if anything, that are not mandatory programs that we carry. And they're definitely key to a lot of the folks in the district, such that organizations have been formed even around the performing arts to support that. Um, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this other than just to point out that I don't want to cut too far. And we also have to have faith that our efforts for financial, for being fiscally responsible in the district managing over time, my, throughout my time, before my time, we've said, hey, we are gonna need an override. It's a six to eight year cycle. So we're gonna almost have to take it year by year, do the best we can, not keep level services and then see where we get to next year. And that may mean the over, that may be an override town for one town or, or both. I'm off my soapbox. I think it's important to understand the scope of what we're talking about in terms of an override. And, and I agree with you, Ken, we, we have to go year to year, but we've been trying to caution and signal that going year to year is, is, is leading us down a, 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 a disassemble path, right? I mean, we're not talking about good decisions when we're talking about eliminating exploratory programs for kids. I mean, I don't think, you think I don't think you think I'm coming to you saying this is a great idea. <clears throat> Let's lessen the program. Our history is maybe this isn't the program we need any longer. How can we convert this into a better opportunity for kids? That's how we like to look at opportunities for efficiency or for reduction. What we're what I'm coming to you with now is 
we're being asked to do a near impossible thing, which, which is land this budget in a year in which the increase is higher than typical on the year on the heels of COVID to bring this in to create the appearance of us reducing our budget for Essex for next year. And the only way to do that is to start taking apart. We are, you know, 80% people in this organization and programs are people. Somebody quoted me back, quoted that back to me earlier in the meeting, which is absolutely true. So we have to look at our staffing, which is going to translate into two things, less program, bigger class sizes. There is nowhere else to go unless we want to agree as a team and, you know, I'm here. You make the decisions, but I think we need to hear the argument for we could take a million dollar 980 to a million and 1 dollars in reserves and just put it into the budget. Pam, would you be, would you be okay with, um, I know it's really late, but should we open it up to public comment? We have a lot of people on the call right now, and maybe we could have a quick second public Can comment. Can we just section? show you one thing very quickly? Yeah. Which is, we ran the scenario if you wanted to get to that 3-8 mark, and that just bumps up the numbers a little bit more. The cuts are basically the same. Um, but you'd be going up to like a $668,000 use of reserves. And then this is just the, the, a very important thing we want you to see. And then I'm, I'm more interested in hearing from other people because I'm a broken record at this point. This is what the next three years look like in a projection in terms of reserve usage to offset the budget. So if we start at the 518 mark this year, by FY26 without an override, we're at a million. So, you know, back of, your, back of the envelope, if you start with double this, this year, you're going to be um, incrementally higher, uh, significantly higher here in the out year. And I'm sure Avi can run that on his calculator while we're talking. Um, and in the end, it does nothing to do address the apportionment issue. We're going to continue to have the apportionment issue year in and year out. So we will be stuck in that loop of having to make more reductions on top of the reserves to hit the mark which um, we're being asked to this year. So, in the we, yep, go ahead. The, the, apportion, the apportionment issue is that there are a more Essex students and fewer Manchester students. No, um, no, paper got that a little wrong. There are more Manchester students than Essex students. It's still at about a 65, 35 split, but the rate of the, as the bubble classes roll out, more Manchester students are exiting the district than Essex students. So as a portion of the whole, Essex is growing. Thank you. They have not overcome them. It's still about 65-35, which is the other complication in our cutting. I mean, we're really this year trying to solve a hundred, what well, was originally a $120,000 problem for Essex. It's now down to, it was down to a $60,000 problem by our, um, our second iteration of the budget, but for every dollar we need to cut to assist Essex, we have to cut three times as much here because of the way it falls through the apportionment formula and the fact that Manchester pays 65% of the apportionment and Essex pays 35%. And so where are we, we're feeling very uncomfortable taking money out of reserves because we're, we've been signaled that, um, the town of Essex might not support an override next year. Yes. But if we were all working together and we could get a commitment from both town officials that we could, um, that everybody was w understanding and willing that the, that we need to have an override in 2024, that we could feel comfortable using slightly less of our reserve slightly more of our reserves and making slightly less cuts. We're going to have to make some cuts regardless, but if we have, if we feel like we have a plan, all of us, the school committee and both towns all moving forward together, that we all have a plan that we all understand that we need an override in 2024, then the school, school district can feel a little more comfortable taking a little bit more out of reserves because then it's really just a bridge loan that's going to be replaced in one year. 
But if we don't feel confident that everybody's going to be supportive of an override in 2024, then we really feel like we need to have the reserves in there for two years to extend in case we have to go for an override in the second out year. We really want to keep the lights on and the children learning and things humming along during that interim. So we need to plan ahead. Am I getting all that right? You're absolutely getting that right. It took me eight years to understand the school budget, but um, here I am. So I think that is, that's the crux of it. Like right now we just, if we felt comfortable, like we really had that support from our families and the communities and the town leadership that we really felt like we had that support for an override in 2024, which would be a large override, but not a huge balloon override. It would be kind of a, then, then we would feel like we could make less cuts, but because we don't feel like we have that right now, because that's not what we're hearing, um, then we feel like we have to make more cuts to reserve our reserves. Okay, I know I just said the whole thing twice. So, um, do we have more uh, other people who want to talk on school committee? I do. I just along with what you just said, um, having been in the collaboration process, um, since we still have. A really strong number of people paying attention to this on on the phone line right now. Um, with what Sarah just said, it's important to know that right now we have only been hearing from the people in positions in our collaboration meeting, and those are the people who are leading, you know, the the town government board, you know, the board of selectmen and the um, the town administrator and a representative from the finance committee. So. Those are the people we're hearing from, and those are people whose jobs it is to to make numbers work and to make sure things are able to pass and and that sort of thing. But what what we really kind of struggled with today um, is getting a sense of how do we know what the actual town wants and and whether the opinion that's coming into collaboration meeting is really whether really what the majority of the town wants or whether it's what the leadership wants because we have opposing forces going right now I, I, and and it's really important um, for the people listening right now to let us know but it, equally importantly to let the town officials know if you have if you have concerns about this because we're not hearing otherwise right now and I just, I really think that if, especially if you're considering opening up for public comment again, um, that as we consider these, these opposing forces right now of Essex, making a specific ask of coming in lower than last year's apportionment, when our costs have gone up, we haven't had some influx of money and Essex's um, use is rising. Is that something that the, the town wants to see it wants to see do you want to see us making cuts to do that or do you want to see the town finding other ways and working collaboratively to find that funding i'm sick so i'm sure that didn't come out as succinctly but i i just really want people to know that this has been a process that has not ended and and it's it seems to be getting worse not better ken are you raising your hand oh you're just stretching um, other people on school committee? Do we want to open up? Let's open up the chat and see if we get a little public comment on this. That would be great since people are willing to stay up this late. We haven't had a lot of late night meetings lately, so it's good. I'll bring the slide back up in a second. I just needed to get to a place. So it's open process for public comment. If you have something to say, please put your name and your town in the chat and your name and your town only. No peanut gallery comments, please. Oh my gosh. Pretty um all right. So uh we can't That's clear out the chat, but we'll be starting with Annie. Hi, I don't can you hear me? Barely. Really? It's, it's a damn computer. Um, okay, so just a couple of rapid fire questions. Uh, I want to know. Yeah, why well, Andy, we can't we can't hear you well enough. I'm sorry. I'm plugging in. Okay. Or to somebody else. Okay. Is there anybody else besides Annie who would like to make a comment on the budget?
I'll, uh, as maybe people want to debate loading up, I'll just say one thing, just because I know um, I know Ben had spoke previously um, in the public comment as well. I think that that's where I'd like to kind of see more information because you know there's there's conversations around kind of the the will of the the, the will of the voters and kind of um, what folks at the annual meeting may vote and kind of what how that will go. But then there's also the kind of the realities of as Ben had mentioned previously about budget and um, in Essex and kind of what else would need to be cut from the town budget. So I think more clarification or kind of around those two things in kind of how do you, how do you divide, how do you slice that pie? Sorry, this isn't coming out as articulate as it was in my head, but I think those are two different forces. There's, there's a reality of the town's budget, but then there's also kind of the, the, the sentiment among the voters and kind of just getting more information on both of those things, I think would be helpful to kind of inform this conversation as well. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, Annie says she's ready, so let's go ahead and let Annie have her comment. Sure. This is, these are just some rapid fire questions. If Pam or could answer um, first, can you just tell us the delta between 4.15 and 3.5 for Essex? What is the dollar amount that Essex is fighting for? Annie, Annie, we don't. We're not, I'm going to let that one go. But we remember we don't do a back and forth. Question. Yeah, I know. Okay, I'm just I'm just asking. You you don't have to answer them. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, you know, in terms of the commitment for next year, you know, that's uh, that's hard, I think, for them to do, but it's also, I mean, more importantly, we need the Essex Finance Committee and Board of Selectmen to support the budget this year. Last year at town meeting, they came to the meeting and um, complete un completely undermined the district. And so we need to see a commitment this year, and we need to also have them reiterate the fact that we have been a very collaborative partner, that we have included them in many meetings, some of which their membership does not attend. So um, uh, we need to have the support of the leadership this year. And then I'm gonna send you guys just some thoughts I have about how I would think about this. Um, but uh, I, I like where Pam's going with this. I guess I do wanna ask about that potential staffing tied savings and whether that could move to the co to the recommended column and what that would do. Uh, yep, I can answer that because Avi and I had that discussion this afternoon. Once you move into, I mean, in the 50-50 package, we're looking at five and a half or so more heads reductions already. So when you're starting to um, just cut the position, so when people leave, you're not replacing them, you're not really gaining as much tide savings as you typically would. Because you're jettisoning, the whole position's going away. All right. Um, ben is waiting to talk. Ben, go ahead. Sure. I was just going to, first of all, I'm, I'm going to express my opinion. I'm not representing uh, the finance committee in saying this, but I think. Um, just reiterating before about um, a, an override for next year, I think that's really critical to do. I think one of the aspects that's difficult in terms of uh, uh, in terms of making a blanket statement in terms of supporting the override is just knowing what the actual revenue correction amount will be for the override because that is. You know, it, and I can tell you personally that I think that the 3.5% number is a reasonable number, you know, over time. And I think we've, we've had that discussion. So if you extrapolate that number going forward, what does that translate to in terms of what the actual ask is in making the revenue adjustment? And I, I think it's just some math. I mean, it's, you know, it's a short term, long term kind of accrual question. Uh, that, uh, and I think just every, educating everybody in terms of eyes wide open and the sooner that we can do that, I will say, I have no sense of what the pulse is in terms of support or against, if you just think about the question of an override, um, I think, I, I think that will become more clear just through discovery and looking at what the number is. But I mean, I do think that. I think that's the path we need to go on. And I also just want to say I really understand the complexity of what you're of what you're trying to do here. I mean, this is uh, 
and you know it's it's tricky as as being part of a, a town governing body because we're trying to balance so many different competing factors in terms of the town's needs the districts it you know it's all it it's 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 a difficult conundrum so i appreciate all the work and great questions and everything you're doing and i'll just leave it at that okay thanks ben um, Pam, I think you could speak to that question of what the override amount would be right now and then what it would be in different scenarios. Yeah, so it would probably be right around this 1.1 to 1.5, depending on how healthcare comes out um, and how we end where we end this process. And that divides about two thirds, one third to each town? Mm -hmm. Approximately. Yep. All right. Um, Okay, I'm not seeing. Oh, Guy Bradford is also in the chat, and then maybe we. Oh, and then Annie's in the chat again. Okay, so maybe we can hear from Guy and then Annie, and then um, maybe wrap it up. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, and Eli's there too. Okay. Yes, yes of course you can. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, so just because I'm new to this as well, um, and I think I understand the, the process here, but. Um, you know, Essex, the, the rate that Essex's, uh, budget that goes towards the school is, is increasing for a couple of different reasons. I understand all that. Um, would we have the opportunity to hear what types of cuts Essex would have to take to their overall town budget? And I'm, I'm wondering if I'm understanding this correctly, um, because if we're not able to meet their ask, does then the town of Essex need to cut other programs out of their budget or do they have the ability to you know say pass a higher town budget or are there restrictions you know around two and a half percent with that or would we have the opportunity to understand you know depending on how we vote how that would also affect the town of essex because i i do think that's really important to take into account here right I'm you know, I, see, I, I know Ben's still on the call, and I know that the finance committee committee is meeting on Thursday. So maybe that's something that they can discuss in their finance committee meeting and get back to us on. That would be awesome. Yeah, I just that's don't awesome. know if we'll have the opportunity to understand that. That would be very helpful for for me to understand a bit about. You know, and I know again, it's very complicated, but yeah. We can certainly, if they have time to discuss that in their meeting on Thursday, we can certainly distribute the answer to that question to the school committee members. Thanks, Sarah. Um, guy, guy, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, so, so 2 things quickly. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. So, 1st of all, uh, I think Ben in his earlier comments. Sort of laid out where we stand budget wise. And uh, we're, we're looking right now. In, in our own fiscal budget. Um, we, we are, we are. A ways away from from meeting the two and a half percent levy um, maximum increase. So, I I think that's one point. It, it, it given given the given the number that um, uh, that we're currently looking with the school budget. But the other thing I wanted to to uh, address was. I want to make sure that that there's an understanding where the at least the board of selectmen feel that they are in terms of achieving what we think needs to happen, which is a which is an override vote in 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 not this year but the following year, is we feel that our ask to 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 have the uh, the district come in at a request under last year's uh, um, increase is going to be a material, have a material uh, impact on our ability to, to achieve an override in the following year. That's, that's our perspective. I, I'm, I've heard I've heard sort of comment that that you know others don't you know think that that's relevant. I don't think 
I don't agree with them. I think we need to show that we're working as hard as we can to our to our residents so that we can get to the bigger picture, which is the override in the following year. Okay. Thank you, Guy. Uh, Annie and then Eli. Hi. So Hi. Uh, what is the delta between 3.5 this year and 4.15 in the blue column in, in dollars? What are we fighting about? What's to, the um, To the town of Essex? Yeah. What's the difference between, uh, um, Pam or Annie, can you answer that? Or Avi, maybe. Or Avi. Total original delta was 120. So I think we're around 60. So it's 60. Last year it was 40. And this year it's 60. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I guess the other question is when you look at, um, and I, I think this is something to contemplate, not necessarily to answer tonight, but look at, um, you know, I would be looking at, okay, what am I going to be asking for next year? And what's the split going to be, you know, what is the, the amount coming to, to from Essex in terms of the budget override? What do we be at? What would be asking residents to pay? And what is that? You know, I'd want to know, okay, well, what does that mean per household? Like how manageable will this override be? Because then I want to back in what I'm looking at this year. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to have a number that's so not possible for an override. Um, that the starting number at this point, Annie, is one and a half million. Yeah, so that's point. Is that 500,000 for Essex? It, it can't be that. Is that what it would be? Percent of that. Yep. Yeah. And it doesn't go along with it's not a by apportionment. Is the apportionment also? And that's just to address current concern. It doesn't build in. I think Essex has a desire to build in five years of apportionment mm -hmm. backup. Yeah. Okay. And, I'll shut up. You know, and I, I think I have to have a responsibility to say we're focused very much on the Essex conversation right now. We have an entire other partner who hasn't weighed in yet on where they stand on the override, um, what it means for them. The number is escalating. Um, the more we try to hit this apportionment target, um, we're taking money out from this year that could be coming into the bu budget. So I think, you know, we have to have that two town conversation about what this means. All right, we've got one more comment from Eli and I think that'll be the last public comment for tonight. And then we'll end with school committee comment or more discussion if we need to. I just answer quickly the question about yes. The difference yeah. between the 50 50 package and a 4.2 to Essex and the, the, the 3.8 <clears throat> package is uh, $80,000 of assessment difference and 30,000 of that would go to Essex. Okay. Eli? Hey. So hey, thanks for staying on the call. Oh, you have you know, my complete sympathies, trust me. Um, so, um, as far as uh, the compromise plan is concerned, and the notion of an override following 2024, um, unless I misunderstand it, it suggests the idea that we are going to accept um, some aspects of program cuts this year with the expectation that we would be restoring them in a subsequent year. But I've also heard what sounds like potentially conflicting um, advice from Essex um, requesting that we actually come in lower so that we would restore to a lower set of um, uh, educational capabilities, and I'm not really clear on what the override in 2024 would ultimately be asked to achieve, whether or not it would be a full restoration or a partial restoration. Um, I suspect 
that Manchester residents would be um, strongly in favor of, of keeping the services that we currently have. Um, I also think that the notion of reducing capabilities only to restore them a year later. Um, well, it seems to put it in colder terms, inefficient. Um, and to put it in uh, 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 more emotional terms, I, I guess, uh, that doesn't seem like a good idea. I, I, I just don't see why we would uh, cut ourselves to the bone only to, to know, know and planning and the notion that we'd be um, uh, expecting to restore those programs in a, a subsequent year. Um, I don't have a solution to that. I just have a gut feeling that it sounds like a bad idea. I try to address what the thinking is because he makes perfect. He makes a lot of sense, but I think the, it's the reserve projections. Eli, if we went, if we do what, what you said, which is where we were last year, which is we're not making any cuts. We're just going to hold. We're, we're going to be looking to take 985 to 1.13 million dollars out of reserves this year to plug the hole. Um, which sets us up for a much faster decline than what's on this page. Right now, if we're assuming the 50, 50 package, we start with 518, we anticipate going to 786 next year. And, and if we're not successful with an override needing a million dollars. The following year. I get it. So, uh, if we went with a million this year, I mean, we just, you know, we're taking our reserves down just under about a third. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. Um, I just, uh, um, just doesn't leave us with any to many tools to, to deal with. You know, we've got the reserves. Forget about the fields there, you know, that question came up early. That's cast out to 25 at best right now, unless something changes drastically. We have that asset that is beginning to fail at Essex. Um, we need to have some cash on hand to be able to deal with something should it come up. So I would caution against spending too low on the reserves. And we are also trying to plan for that building project. So. If we deplete reserves, I don't think we're going to be successful in asking for an override to reinstate reserves to put us in a position to borrow, but maybe we could. Yeah, I, I get it. I just, um, my, my gut feeling is that we are um, not doing an adequate job of addressing the holistic um, uh, finances of the tree and where of the school, the school, the, and Essex and Manchester. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a particular solution. I'm just not, uh, I'm not thrilled with this position right now. I can honestly say this is our 12th budget and it, I, this is the hardest one and the one I have the least sense of in terms of where we're going long term. Yeah, let's just let's have some school committee discussion. If that's okay with everybody. I would say I've been doing this for 12 years and I think Pam and I, or I've been doing this for eight years. I've been following along for longer, but I've been doing this for years. Um, this is the hardest budget we've, we've been cutting every year. Like I ran for school committee because I didn't think the schools were doing enough. And I wanted to see those budgets where we started adding in some things. And in my 1st years on school committee, um, the principals used to come during budget season and talk about their hopes and dreams. And then a few years ago, we just stopped doing that because we were consistently cutting everything instead of ever trying to address. The hopes and needs of the principals, which were things like. Math specialists, you know, it wasn't like we wanted to have uh, bells and whistles and fancy things. We just wanted to meet the needs of the children. Um, 
so it's really disappointing to me that we're now in a position again of being asked to make more cuts. Um, but I just thought maybe we needed to close up with a little school committee discussion and then um, given the hour, I think we need to maybe wrap it up and continue this conversation at our next meeting, which will maybe we need to decide what that meeting is going to look like. Sarah, just a comment. Yeah, um, I appreciate the feedback from everyone. Um, just the mention of the, the school fields. Um, I do have to say the school fields for those of for the parents and people that participate in sports, at least the field at the high school is in very rough shape, a lot of damage and it's getting to the point where even I as a non sports person can see. Yeah, this is getting to a, a safety issue and I know we keep pushing it out, but there may be some point in time where that can't support fields or that can't support athletics with a straight face or certain things. Um, in terms of the the budgets, the essentially as a district, we get the chance to ask once a year for funding and put that out in front of the voters. And I appreciate the candor of the town leaders and saying, you know, here's what we feel, here's what we think, but we don't necessarily know what the sentiment of the, the population of the voters are. So I would be hesitant to try and guess too much. And I would probably tend to use whatever we put forward as a budget this year to, as a way of gaining, you know, how are we doing and do we have the support? Because I hear from the parents and I hear from a lot of folks saying the schools are an important asset. We need to, we need to, to do, to handle that. Um, at the Essex town meeting, I was struck. There was a lot of dissension last year on what, whether the school budget should be supported or not, yet there was still overwhelming support um, by more than a, more than a, I think it was 80%, 20% for the school budgets. So I hesitate to be too cautious and try and save our way to success too closely. That's the vote, my the vote at the Essex town meeting was, it was more like 60, 40, um, which was disappointing, but not surprising given the, given the sort of the tone of how, um, how it was presented. Um, I think we really need to know that parents are supporting the budget and supporting the school. And I would like to say like, I know, I know that schools aren't perfect. I know that sometimes people have a bad experiences or a bad year, or like you don't like your teacher one year or something went wrong, or, or maybe even you didn't like the school so much that you decided they weren't a good fit for your child and you decided to pull out of the school, or maybe you don't even have kids in the schools um, because maybe you just don't have kids. But I think that there are a lot of reasons to support the public schools, regardless of your own personal experience and regardless of whether or not your own students are using them. So it's just important to think about all of the all of the reasons towns need good public schools in order to thrive. Um, you know, people move to towns because they have good public schools. Our housing, our house, our, the values of our homes go up because we have good public schools. When people are moving to towns, they support the industries that are there. They keep it vibrant. They join committees. They get involved. Um, and it's just really important to have good public schools. So I think we need to continue to support them. And I'd love to have people reach out to their select board. We, you can reach out to us too. We'd love to hear from you, but. Um, I think we're at the point now where it's clear that our town leadership needs to hear that people are supporting the schools. And, and I agree with Ken, like whatever budget we go to the towns with um, at town meeting, we'll need to know that people are there voting and supporting the schools at town meeting. That's really important. Um, and Essex is going to be on May, I want to say May 5th, if I have it right. Um, anyway. Two. Two. Any second? Second. <laughs> Wait, did you just make a motion to end? No, 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 no. Oh, I was no. trying to remember the date of Essex Town Meeting. Oh, when you said second, I thought it cut out, and I was like, wait, we're done. Okay. No, no I didn't do that. Okay. No, I'm still thinking, talk. Teresa. No, it wasn't actually. I want to talk. Directionally, where is the committee? What's that, Pam? Directionally, where is the committee? I'm and having a we, hard time. Um, sort of weighing the request to cut what comes out to be $60,000, but for the town of Essex, which then balloons to $180,000, um, considering that there was a similar request last year and that when we went to fall town meeting, we had over a million dollars in free cash in the town of Essex. Um, 
so I guess I'm looking for some sort of assurance from the the finance committee or the, the board of selectmen that they have exhausted every opportunity as well, because I feel like we are really trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel here and cutting things that we are hearing very clearly from our community members. People do not want to make these cuts, but we don't have any wiggle room. And so it would be, you know, reassuring to hear from the towns that they have looked at every possible option as well for covering that gap. Teresa. On a related note, um, again, having been in the in the collaboration meetings and um, attended a recent board of selectmen, not the last one, but the one before, um, I agree with Kate. I, it's I understand that they can't make a commitment necessarily and say, yes, we're going to do this or yes, we're going to back this. I do understand that. But what I'm missing here, all I'm seeing is coming to the table and saying it has to be less than last year over and over. And what I'm missing is what have you, what else have you done? This is not just a this year process. And that's what I'm having trouble with as an Essex representative on a district school committee is being able to come to the table and say, look, my town is having trouble with, with meeting a budget this year. We can be collaborative partners, but here's the plan moving forward. And I haven't seen any of that. I haven't seen any of how are we going to handle this moving forward? Because this is not something that's going to change next year. And it's actually only going to be worse for us as we're, we're in a bigger hole or dealing with override situation. So I'm missing that from, from either the collaborative session or from town leadership generally. How is Essex going to reconcile that this is what it costs to run a district? We're past the point of, is it wise spending? We've got all objective measures saying that it is. And I don't really like the idea that we're considering eliminating foreign language exploratory K through six because of a budget. If we're looking at, at at a program assessment, you know, taking a look at all of the things and decide that there's realignment and that sort of thing for educational value. That's one thing, but just because we can't afford it, but I, I just, I don't see that. And, and I don't feel like we're getting, um, I'm sure, you know, Pam and Avi, this is the, the bell you've been ringing for a couple of years. I know, but th there's going to be a point where there's nothing left here. And so this is what it costs to run a district. If, if you aren't able to do that, we're going to have to look at some much bigger, more serious concerns and options because this is what it costs to run a district. If we have to make the cuts that are on this, let, let's say the decision is we're going all cuts this year. Where we go beyond this, I don't know. Yeah. Right? I mean, you can only take so much out of staffing before you're at your, you know, you're going to be at 28, 30 kids in a classroom and in our classrooms aren't large classrooms. So we're going to have some space concerns once the class size is balloon. Like, for example, if we take out the math teacher at the middle high school, if we don't replace that position, we're probably okay right now. We're going to be looking at 18 to 24. It never shakes out completely, even across the board in high school based on enrollment and different course configurations. But 18 to 24, manageable. Low to low benchmark to hot over benchmark, but we can manage it at the elementary school. If we reduce that position, we're probably going to be right on the cusp of high end benchmark at 22, 23 in the class for a little bit. So we'll be okay for a little bit. But once we start, I mean, I don't know where we haven't fully identified what eight teacher cuts would look like. And then it wouldn't be just teachers. It would be across the board, but eight personnel cuts would look like. But with every cut, those class sizes are going to go up. So we're going to lose that advantage. And as class size goes up, we know historically that it correlates typically to, and if I'm if I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Um, it usually correlates to a higher degree of request for evaluation for special education and then higher find, which just escalates the cost of special ed, which is a compliance component, which has to be spent on, and then forces a greater set of cuts in the general ed if there's no additional revenue coming in. So what we're probably looking at if this continues beyond this year is I would have to come to and recommend some significant structural changes to the district. And I think we have to put everything on the table. Do we collapse the school? Um, you know, should we look at the enrollment and see if we're at a point right now where we could potentially um, move fifth grade up to the middle school? close Essex Elementary and bring all of those students over to Memorial School. Take one site offline 
and maybe take off the table the need to have to replace another building. That would create long term significant savings for both towns. I haven't studied it. I don't know if we can fit everybody. It might work. It might not. We might have to look at different grade level configurations. Maybe um, the sixth grade comes out of the middle school. We collapse the middle school model. You move to 712, you streamline the leadership team. You use, you go backwards, you go with more of an industrial efficiency model of scheduling. So you can really pack um, future schedules. We can move into something like that. I think all those things would have to be studied if the end goal is a two and a half percent budget annually. And I think what we saw in the first slide is the two and a half percent budget doesn't even solve the problem for the town of Essex. So it's really at this point, um, it is very much a community conversation about what you want from your schools. Um, I would try not to get distracted from micromanagement of the underlying components of the budget. We have laid this out here to you year in and year out. We will answer any question. It's all been done collaboratively with our partners up to this point. So I don't think we have a, a spending problem. I think we have a revenue problem. We have a structural problem, which is um, one of all school districts, which is you grow faster than two and a half percent. So you've got a structural problem that um, trails you from year to year. But I think, you know, you saw, we had a wonderful presentation at the beginning of this meeting that shows you the work that is the product of the community and the school collaboration, the hard work of our staff, and you know the wonderful progress that our kids make um, by the time that they are upperclassmen. So I think the communities have a, a, a very good investment in their schools, and I, I am being very honest. I have not felt this way in the entire time that I've been here in approaching the budget that I feel like we're at a real turning point. I know I keep putting that little icon up there, but I feel like we're at a, a very large decision point in terms of what you want from the quality of your schools. I, I think we're at a large decision point and I feel like we've been here before as before my time. I feel like t when the two towns decided to come together and make a regional agreement just over 20 years ago, I feel like that was a big decision point for the towns. And then I feel like um, uh, there have been other big decision points since then. Um, and I, I'm like losing my mind now because it's past my bedtime. Um, but, uh, oh, I know because when we had to do the new Memorial School building. So when I was, when I first moved here, we did a big, there was a big survey because when you go through the MSB, there's a big survey and people really wanted their neighborhood schools. They really want like people in Essex really wanted their little school in Essex. Like people in Essex do not want to ship all of their students to Manchester, go to school. People want their schools. And so I think that. And then we've just had our big strategic plan. So we did a huge survey and we had lots of people from the school and lots of community members participate in the strategic planning project process. And we haven't heard what we've heard is that they want more and better and more performing arts and more music and more everything. And like sometimes different things like different schedules or later starts or whatever, but people have wants. But I have not heard from anybody. We want less. We want to change. We want to a two and a half percent. We want packed classrooms. We want 30 kids in a class. Like, I haven't been hearing that. So that's my 2 cents. So it's time for us to then advocate. I can't believe I have to say this. Really fight for level services, it, you know, what I'm saying? but, but that's kind of what we have to do is find out if, if families. And families have to start showing up. So that's on us to do the legwork to make sure that people understand that and, but make sure that families are showing up with their opinions because there's a, otherwise there's no, there's no way to go with this, but to they hear the voices that we hear. So I, I'm sorry, I totally didn't answer Pam's question, which was, where are we like, where are we falling out on this? And I would say, um, I think I want to maintain as much of our services as possible while also maintaining the reserves necessary to do whatever we have to do. I know that we've split numbers like I feel like almost infinitely at this point, but what I was hearing for at the last board of selectmen meeting was that they wanted a number that was less than what was it? 3.95.
That would be this here. Right. So what does it look like if we go up to 3.9 or 3, you know, like what is the closest margin that we can get to? It makes me think that I would like to put conditions on what we ask for in some ways around reliable partnership and, you know, we've done the reserve, we began using reserves, um, unanimous support or decisions that are made and communications that are kept. Um, again, I, I lean toward this, when I started my term, we were having Manchester was the one that had the harder asks than Essex. And at the end of the day, it's the, there were three separate government entities. I love the collaboration. We need to work together, but we also, in some ways, have a different mission than the other two government entities and towns. If I could just say something about that too quickly, um, I think it's unrealistic for us as a school committee to try to put that on the town boards of Essex and try to ask for some level of commitment because you know the bottom line is is that you know yes they would make recommendations at town meeting but it's also not up to them right uh you know they have their job to do as duly elected officials but to try and ask for you know some type of future support based off of you know not really you know i mean none of us are going to be able to predict the future right so i just don't see how that's really realistic I, and i could be very wrong on this uh just doesn't Chris, <laughs> i'll share that <laughs> yeah that ask comes from um many years of team multi-year planning so that we wouldn't be surprising anybody with something right. out of left field so it's not like we're look i think what we're maybe a better way of framing it is that what we're asking for is them it is for our partners to help us message and recognize that we have a long term structural problem that needs to be addressed. Right. And that if, if we are going to assume all, essentially the district is going to assume all of the risk in hope that there will be a long term outcome favorable to us. Without having an open conversation about their willingness to endorse and advocate it, we have never done an override where we haven't all collectively agreed in 2012 when we went out and went out for an override it was a multi-year discussion a plan to do so <clears throat> with endorsement from all town boards yep i, I just don't see how we could have possibly predicted the changes in a in apportionment or have have we been talking about that for years now yes we okay have. Yeah, and we have a multi year budget model that we put out that shows. You know, Avi, please speak to it. I know you, you designed it. it. It will show with some. With a high level of predictability where our. Um, numbers are going to land each year, so there's really no surprise in where our budget comes in. And if we go back to that 5 year history. <clears throat> it's been the exact same story throughout. So I would just add on the multi year budgeting. Uh, we definitely been talking just like when you when we put something to the taxpayers about Memorial School. The question was, we can't vote on this without knowing what might be around the corner for Essex Elementary. And we presented many scenarios, and I think the same thing is true here. We can't really commit um, one time funds without having some sense of what's around the corner. So I think that's what we're trying to figure out in terms of apportionment. Um, I think we have enough data to know that it's move, it has been moving towards Essex over two years and that because there's a three year smoothing formula that it would keep going. I think everyone has been a little surprised about the acceleration in that. So I, I think I can see both sides there because this year it, it ratcheted up even faster than we knew it would. We knew it would go up a little bit. So um, there, there's only so much of that modeling that we can do. We, we saw there be an increase in it. I think it has surpassed expectations and I think that's part of what you're hearing from the town. Gotcha. The good thing is that this is something that has happened before. And so it's because I've had to make it my business to learn about this too. And so, so even if it wasn't happening in the last, you know, obviously in our face in the last X number of years, it's something that we know is a possibility because that's part of the district agreement. And so it requires some forethought and planning. Essex has 
taken a step last fall with some of the uh, free cash spent at Essex Town Meeting to start a fund for the years where this happens. But we're just now into that. So that's right. That's part of the kind of planning that needs to continue going. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's extremely unfortunate, you know, due to the uh, gap in the overall enrollment of the towns, anytime Essex apportionment is going up faster. It just has such a such a higher effect on our budget than when it goes up in Manchester, right? Because of the way this works. Because if if Manchester was asking us for cuts, it would be the opposite. You know, if they were asking us to cut a hundred thousand dollars out of the budget, um, that would only mean, you know, that would mean a much smaller cut for the school committee, right? Um, so unfortunately, that that's the really difficult part about this is that, uh, you know, a cut of our budget by Essex gets magnified by 3x, right? So, I think, Chris, something that may be lost in this conversation tonight is that, and it's a question that I think I had in the original slide, is should we be seeking to solve the apportionment problem anyway, or is that the town's responsibility? Not that we can't partner with them, um, to try to find some mutually agreeable solutions. But what we've agreed to is that we would use our reserves and any cuts necessary to reach the three and a half assessment mark. And that the towns need to take care of how that flows through the apportionment formula for them. So I do think your questions about what are they doing to address how that works on their end becomes very important because one of my big concerns here is that if we were to pass an override this year, when we go and go to run the apportionment formula next year, the problem will still exist. So we're going to be right back into the conversation of, we just passed an override, we put more money in, we're at our three and a half assessment, but they're still at 4.2. So I don't know how we're just not back in this conversation again. Yeah. So I think that's what gives me pause on what is really the long-term solution here and what does it do to, to our programming and to our staffing if, if that's we're stuck in a cycle. Yeah, I mean, that that's my major fear here too. <clears throat> and I also have a fear that, you know, using reserves, right? So, I, <clears throat> I don't know. I, how I feel about this is that there, there's definitely no good answer here or no good choice. That that really stinks when there's not some, you know, some good choice here. That there really just doesn't seem to be one. Which I've been listening the whole time, hoping to hear some, you know, <clears throat> benefit to maybe this approach or that approach. It doesn't seem like any of the pro these approaches are uh, really good at all. Um, you know, I just have a big fear as well, you know, uh, that, you know, I know credit agents, agencies don't simply look at, uh, you know, a single year and say, oh, you know, your reserves are great right now. So that's perfect. They, you know, same thing with credit reports. They look back, you know, seven years, 10 years. Right. So uh, I'm worried that if our overall budget in general and our reserves suffers that we're going to end up paying. I'm, I'm worried that I'm going to, uh, as a taxpayer, going to end up paying millions of dollars more down the road to save sixty thousand dollars. You know, what, whatever it is, right? I, I have a really big concern about that, and I haven't wrapped my head around that yet. So that's where I stand. Which is why I'd really like to understand what the, <clears throat> you know, what the other options are, or, you know, what the options would be for Essex to take cuts other way, ways, because I do fully understand that, you know, it's not just the school side, it, it is also the town side, and it's very important to have that collaboration, and just to understand what would suffer out of the town of Essex budget, right, or what would need to be potentially cut. I, I'd really like to understand that, so, what their ideas would be. Three one, we're going to have to make a determination about a number. You don't necessarily have to make the final determination about how we 
structure and reserve usage and cuts or what the cuts will be that we can carry on on that discussion through March and into April. Uh, we have some internal timelines we would need to hit if it has staffing implications. But to some degree, we are going to have, to, I mean, we are going to have to land on a final number. And Avi will remind me that reserve. Can we just put in a, Avi remind me, can we just put an unidentified reduction in there? Or will we have to allocate something to reserves and something to spending cuts? We need to have a budget that has a clear revenue number and a clear expenditure number. And um, so we need to plant a flag on the reserve side. You can change that subsequently. Uh, the law does say that if the assessment to a town does not increase, you can make a change after town meeting. They do have the right to vote on it, but they don't have the requirement. They could wait 45 days. But I think for next, you know, I think we need to have a budget that has a clear revenue number and clear uh, expenditure number. Where the individual cuts happen does not need to be specifically identified. We will need to uh, be clear on how, uh, whether they're instructional or not instructional for the apportionment formula, be able to run that model. Can I just say how happy I am that there's still almost 70 people on the call? This is unheard of. For people to care. I mean, really, it was a lot. It was up in 110 for a long time to stay on this. And it's so, important. Two quick parting questions because it is getting late. Um, on the scale of right to left in reserve usage, do I have a sense from the group? What their comfort level is on maximizing or minimizing reserve usage with the with the understanding that the rest would come from cuts, or with the understanding that the rest would be assessed to the towns. You tell me. Well, that's what that's yep. what makes the difference yeah, in so, the right. Yeah. I'm I'm ready to start advocating for our students in our district right now, uh, and to use as little reserves as as we can while still responsibly being good partners with that that historic 3.5 assessment number. Doing what we need to. I really don't want to see us cutting programs. You want to see us in that 3.5 assessment? Well, I think that that's. That's historically what we've been going with. I don't want to see us at that. I want to see us at whatever's going to get us level services. But I guess my point is, without looking, I, I, it's hard for me to say how do we feel about reserve use unless it's painted against cutting staff and programs or or sending the bill to the towns. And Avi, can I, I can pull it. Yeah, me too. Eric. Oh, Chris, did you want to say something? No, this was Chris. I just, I completely agree with Teresa. Oh, yeah. okay. And I said the same. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. So, just so we're clear on exit, Avi, the 3.5 assessment gap number is 985. That was a question. Yeah, uh, yes. Can you scroll over? I don't think that one's on the slide. Can you scroll, Pam? Yeah, it's not on there. Okay. That's where yeah, we, we started. We abandoned originally. that one that long is... with that. We left right. that the Well, I think that's why. Yeah. That's up here. That's the, yes, that's the original that gap. Correct. January 11th, before any changes. And uh, that was the number. That we said from the tentative budget, we would have to find in revenue or expenditure reductions, right? And that had both towns total at three five with apportionment thereafter. Yep, that's the that's the one. So 
So what this slide does is it also assumes, remember, we don't have our final health care number yet, and it is trending in an we believe may trend in an upward direction. The reports that we've received from the past couple of months have us increasing our usage. So if that comes in higher, we've also accounted, I've also accounted for that in this chart. Yeah. So the 985, if the healthcare goes up 150,000 becomes the 1135. So I've no, prepared I cuts to that level just in case. We can always put something back. So I'm the only one sharing an opinion. I would like to know what other people think on this. I shared my opinion. I said I thought we should make um, the least amounts of cuts that we have to make and use whatever reserves we need to. I think we need to have reserves at this point to carry us through for two years because we haven't really had that conversation. And I know. It's hard for people to say, I definitely commit to an override in 2024, but as Pam said, in past years, when we've gone for an override, it's been a collaborative process. Right now, it feels like it feels a little bit like a cagey process and it needs to be like, you know, we're all in this together as towns, as two towns with a school district in the middle that we're all in this together. And we know what, what our multi-plan, multi-year plan is moving forward. But I'm, I mean, I guess if I had to pick 1 of these columns right now, I would pick the highlighted 1 could just be because it's. Highlighted and perfect. My eye is drawn toward it, but I think that that's, I feel like that's the compromise column. If we're making, if we're trying to make a compromise. That gives and the town of Essex the lowest apportionment of any of the choices it uses. It takes half out of reserves, right? And half out of cuts. That's kind of the 50 50 split column. I don't like any of it. I hate all of the cuts. I've advocated for not making any of these cuts before, but I feel like sometimes we have to make really hard decisions to, to work together and make it move forward. I'm leaning on the column to the left, Sarah. Okay. Frankly, I don't want to count for next year or two years out to be any better if, if history is any indication we've got an issue you know we've had an issue it's getting worse we haven't addressed it and really asked the town where's your support level on it rather ask sooner rather than later so i tend to go to the left the no cuts, cuts or the less reserves yeah is that other around... columns to the left? Uh, it's to the right so well i'm looking at it and it's to the right i don't know how it's projecting to you but yeah, well, no, to me, to me, I'm looking like a, the column that's highlighted. I want to, I, I don't, I don't really like the idea of, as, as Eli Bowling said, of, of cutting programs in the hopes that we're going to put them back in. It seems inefficient, wasteful, and kind of not how we do business. If we don't think we need a program, you know, we should, you, Pam, you and Ivy have been good about saying we don't need it. We have to make the change. But these are programs we hope to offer to continue level services. So I don't see why we're cutting them. Okay, so Pam, you're going to move. To no cuts in all reserves, like right I'm, here. I'm more yeah, on that side. Can you see in the, the column at the top that says 285? 285, yeah. Yeah, that's the left. Mm -hmm. 285 in cuts and 850 in reserves. Yeah. And I realize that's higher than what Essex is asking for for on the apportionment, but. Well, they all are. But the question is, are we comfortable with that level of reserves? Because then if we are looking at an override, no matter what, and I'm not saying we have to answer this tonight, but if we're looking at an override, no matter what, that's bumping up that starting point considerably, right, Pam? To, to bring us back to flow. I've been assuming we're putting back maybe not exactly the same things, but at least the FTE, mm -hmm. which means the whole of it becomes the base of the override. So the one, one, three, five. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of with Ken in that using more reserves. I mean, they'll run out eventually if we, if we don't make structural changes. And like, if that, I don't, I don't want to say that's brinksmanship, but if that's what it takes to force, because if you make cuts, then it's like, well, then we can just establish that as a new baseline. I'd almost rather be like, no, like the baseline, like kind of to Teresa's point, like we, we're advocating for the students, we're advocating for the programs. This is how much it costs. Fine, we'll use reserves. And if those are to be exhausted, then 
we need to ask the towns for that money or then there has a much more serious conversation but it seems it seems like the more appropriate thing than trying to figure out the cuts and having that be established as the new normal because i don't want that to be established as the new normal yeah the level services and tam i appreciate one of the things that you and avi have shown me is that being creative and thinking and when you talked about what seemed like very extreme options like regionalizing or even more than that rolling elementary schools or changing the structure and moving grades up and down i expect I expect that that's kind of what you and Avi would be coming up with as as enrollment changes and as things go. So I, I, I'm sticking, I'm for sticking with level services and okay, well, how do we shift and adjust if we need to, or as, as appropriate, even if they seem drastic at the time, but it's a long-term picture we're on here. And long-term, the residents of these communities are not saying, give our kids a little bit less education because we're good with that. We'd rather have more money or we, you know, we, we need to keep our kids educated there. <laughs> They're the future. Sorry, off on a tangent, Slate. So we're saying go here. Yeah, I'm kind of an optics person too, Pam. Instead of at that very top column where it says no cuts, can we put original cuts? Because we were already making cuts, right? We abandoned that. Because we weren't making cuts, we were just pulling money out of the budget and sticking it on the side and saying, if it comes to be, we'll use reserves for it. So you're talking about this back here. Yeah, just okay. Well, even on so, the slide, right? It's like so this. everything on this slide basically ends up being a reserve. Okay. And that's fine if it's the bridge to next year. You know, if like, okay, we're gonna do this, we'll take a chance, a one year chance and if it comes to fruition, we're going to have to back it by reserves, but we're going into next year agreeing that we're, we're asking for an override and it's going to match the amount that we needed to risk this year. That was the theory behind this. But as soon as we came up with this, there was an ask for an additional reduction. So, no, again, without having any clarity on where we're going or any sense of what the commitment is or how we translate a real con a real concern that we're talking about millions of dollars in cuts because we have a sixty thousand dollar overage in the apportionment this year. How that translates into an argument for a um, six hundred thousand dollar increase next year? So I I think we we still just don't have a path forward. So not having a path forward, we said we need to take a more traditional approach to this, which is we need to look begin to look at the program and look at areas where we can take some um, recurring cuts, a, a cut that will last us some time. So, you know, I don't favor cutting the program. I do think it's, I would say it's pretty risky to go all reserves, but that's for the committee to decide. But we don't have to decide this tonight. These are things that we can mull over and come back. We yes. don't have to decide by 3-1. Yes. yes, we have two weeks to decide, including a full week of vacation. Yes. For your it really children. means we have three days to decide. Well, but for the rest of us, that also means that we have that time frame to talk to people in our towns to to find out from people, you know, other information as well. And And again, maybe we can... Maybe we can still add or, or somehow add to this with a, a 3.5 assessment because um, that is what the gentleman's agreement has been for years and that is what you guys came back at. So, it, you know, we're bouncing around to a lot of different scenarios. Yep. It'd just be nice to- 3.5 assessment and then we have to make, be prepared for an additional up to additional 150 in healthcare, maybe the gods will smile upon us and we'll actually get a reduction in what we have in the budget. But I'm not, nobody's mentioned, that has not really been the vibe we, we're getting from the process. So that would put them back up to 499. I, I think it's important that we look at these in actual dollars too, as we're having this conversation. This, oh, what that means for them, no, yeah, actual for the, dollars. For the, towns, for the town of Essex. What that means in dollars. I mean, you have that that nice going forward with our conversations with our townspeople. 
This is the 120 over the median, right, Bobby? But the median's changing. I think it just, mm -hmm. I can give you any dollar amount and then you can maybe update that for next time, but I just need to know compared to which. So. I think it would be helpful to always have that included, knowing that this is the starting point. This is this is what the agreement was, and anything beyond that is compromise. Compromise is a nice word for it. That's all I got. What would you like to see for three one? I would like to have some feedback on what people in town think about the proposals. But that's not what you were asking. You were asking what we'd like to see from you for 3-1. So I think that, I think kind of the same thing, we'll probably, we might have a little more information from any side and I think having the actual dollar amounts for how much the ask to Essex changes with any of the scenarios we're considering is helpful because that was a lot of that was a lot last year over you know last year's increase was forty thousand um to the town which I know is a lot it's a like a salary of a person it's a lot of money in the grand scheme of the budget it's small um, so I think having those dollar amounts on there, it does help put it in perspective a little bit for us because some of us aren't used to looking at so many, so many such big numbers. <laughs> I think if you have any more information, if you're honing down what you think the actual cuts would be, that would be helpful. It's that's on that page. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I know that can change too. So, like when we vote on the first, we are not we're voting on cuts and reserves and the final number. And then what actually gets cut could change. But we're saying that we we would be approving cuts, depending on which column here we approve. We exhausted this. We've exhausted my brain. This and ourselves. Yes. This one might be a record. Mm -hmm. Can I move or? <laughs> you can. Yes. Would you like to move to adjourn the meeting? I would. Yes. Is there a second? Do you want school committee comment? I'll ask for that after the second. <laughs> Can't wait, Teresa. <laughs> Second okay. Warnock. Is there any school committee comment before we finalize the vote to adjourn? I hope Teresa, just my only comment is I hope Teresa doesn't have any more clarifying questions. <laughs> I just said Sorry, no, Teresa. I got nothing. There we go. All right. Um, I'm going to go in roll call order to close out the meeting. Thanks again to all of the people who came and participated and listened to the conversation. Um, we do appreciate having you on the call. Um, okay, Eric. Yes. Matt. Yes. Kate. Yes. Yes. Yes, and you guys are all fantastic. <laughs> Teresa. And yes. Too. Ken. Yes. And I'm a yes too. Chris, I think you're doing great. You're brand new, and you have so many good insights, and you're not willing to sh not afraid to share. It's really good. I'm trying. It'll be really great to actually start meeting you guys in person. I wonder. We'll see. I don't know if that's uh, you know. You know, whatever it is, it'd be great to start meeting uh, you guys in person, even if it's once a month, you know, one remote yeah. once a month. Yeah. Maybe we could take that up officially and at the 3 1 meeting and just map out the rest of the year. Yeah. We should have 1 of the meetings at Essex elementary so that we can all do the walkthrough as a board. Or several so that members of the public will have plenty of opportunities to come. And see the school. True. All right, but we should get Good off night. the call now so we don't accidentally <laughs> talk outside of our meeting. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank Good you. Night.